be delighted to know that, that Josh is uh, here speaking with us today. And uh, I would like to say, Josh, maybe I could, is this something I can start saying that, that um, given that you were an MD-PhD student at UCSF, um, when I was involved in the Brain, Mind, and Behavior course, that I taught you everything that you know about psychiatry? <laughs> Now, the question is, did you ever go to any of the brain, mind, and behavior lectures? <laughs> the fact that he doesn't remember, I think, tells us something. Um, you were probably hard at work in the lab and saying, you know what, I don't need to go, I didn't, don't need to, go to brain, mind, and behavior. Um, Dr. Gordon, um, as I mentioned, received his MD, PhD degree at UCSF and uh, was um, impassioned by uh, psychiatry and neuroscience and uh, did his PhD thesis with um, Dr. Mike Stryker um, there and was working on pioneering methods that allow one to study brain plasticity in the mouse visual system. After finishing his MD, PhD at UCSF, um, uh, Josh went to Columbia University uh, where he did his psychiatry residency and research fellowship and worked with Dr. Renee Hen and was studying the role of the hippocampus. Um, I think, as all of you know here, a structure very important for memory and for emotional processing um, and relevant to anxiety disorders, depression, and schizophrenia. He joined the Columbia faculty in 2004 um, and has uh, been there uh, developing an internationally recognized uh, lab that has really done um, groundbreaking work uh, for the field of biological psychiatry, focusing on understanding um, patterns of neural activity and the way neurons are communicating to each other, um, across distributed systems in mice who carry mutations that are relevant to psychiatric illness, and we'll be hearing about some of that work shortly. Um, in addition to being a, a researcher running a lab, uh, Dr. Uh, Gordon was also involved um, in the Adult Psychiatry Residency Program as an associate director and uh, was directing the neuroscience curriculum there as well as overseeing the research training program for residents. So he's someone who also carries a, a really deep understanding of um, some of the directions we need to go in as a field, both in terms of bringing neuroscience um, more into the curriculum of how we train the next generation of psychiatrists, as well as making sure that we create physician scientists who can um, continue to, to advance the knowledge in our field. Um, uh, Josh has been recognized by a number of prestigious awards, um, including, including um, the Rising Star Award from the uh, International Mental Health Research Organization and the A.E. Bennett Research Award from the Society of Biological Psychiatry and the Daniel Efron Research Award from ACNP. Um, but perhaps, uh, you know, beyond uh, all these um, uh, honors, I think it's uh, important just to, to point out that uh, you know, uh, uh, Josh represents um, really um, the kind of uh, the best of what we can um, feel excited about for the field of psychiatry. Someone who is um, doing very important, um, thoughtful research that is going to allow us to elucidate really critical brain mechanisms for understanding some of the serious mental illnesses, but someone who's also able then to dialogue and to um, interact both with researchers who are doing work at other levels of analysis and also with the um, patient and the patient's family. And we are very, very lucky to have you as our new director of NIMH, um, kind of creating this kind of a path forward for the Institute and for the research that will be carried out in the Institute. And we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vinogradov. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation to come here and speak with you, uh, for coming to hear me, and for tolerating me as your NIMH director. Um, uh, Sophia didn't mention that she was actually my attending on my fourth year psychiatry rotation uh, when I was finishing up at UCSF. Um, maybe there are reasons why she chose to leave that detail out. Um, but I do remember uh, her as a particularly caring and apt psychiatrist, and I really actually did learn a lot about psychiatry um, from you. So thank you for that as well. Um, so I am in the um, unenviable position of being caught between two worlds uh, when I come to talk to people, whether I should talk about science or NIMH agendas. And I've chosen today um, to do a little bit of both at the risk of not doing a good enough justice at either, but I hope you'll bear with me and, and hopefully it'll work out in the end. Um, I, I think it's important um, 
that we think about what are the challenges and opportunities in psychiatric research in general. And so I, I want to sort of start with that. Um, that'll be a little bit my NIMH director hat on top. Uh, and then it, it so happens, of course, that I see uh, two aspects of the challenges and opportunities is relevant to my own research. So I'm going to tell you two stories that emerged from my laboratory. Um, one uh, that's uh, um, a, 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 uh, regarding schizophrenia and looking from gene to behavior through the circuit. Uh, and uh, the second is looking at uh, circuit dynamics and how that might matter and how we can show that matters uh, for psychiatrically relevant behaviors. And both of these stories, of course, are, are going to be uh, stories of, of mouse models and trying to understand the neural basis of psychiatrically relevant behaviors. Um, and then I'll, and, and, and that's the scientist hat. And then I'll put back on my NIMH director hat and talk uh, a little bit uh, about how, what what it would take to to move the kind of research that I and, and others have been doing in the neural circuit field um, to actually being relevant for practitioners in terms of how we can um, uh, imagine developing novel therapies uh, for psychiatric disorders. Um, so, challenges and opportunities. So, uh, the NIMH mission is uh, to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses uh, through basic and clinical research, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. And uh, that mission is a very honorable one, but it's also a very um, daunting one. And, and it's daunting because of the challenges we face in psychiatry. And the first challenge that we have to um, acknowledge is the heavy burden of our illnesses. It's also the reason why our mission is so important. Um, so this is a plot of the percentage of U.S. adults at any given time, I think this was in 2015, who have any psychiatric or substance abuse disorder, and it comes out to close to 20% of adults at any given moment in time are suffering from an episode of, of a psychiatric disorder. Um, it's slightly higher in females and males, um, it's present across multiple ethnic groups. And uh, here in this middle section in the dark blue is the rates for different ages. And what you can see is that psychiatric disorders strike early, right? So that the prevalence is highest in the adolescent to early adulthood range. And that contributes, of course, to the heavy financial burden of these disorders, um, both in terms of the costs of care and the terms of costs of lost work and productivity because not only do they strike early, but they are also generally chronic, which means that individuals suffer from these disorders throughout their lifetime and therefore are impacted functionally by the disorders. In fact, worldwide, psychiatric and neurologic conditions are the number one cause of disability in terms of uh, the burden to worldwide society. In the U.S., it's actually number uh, three right now, um, but rising. So. Um, uh, the sec a second challenge we face is really the inadequacy of our diagnoses. So the diagnostics uh, system that we use in psychiatry called the DSM uh, works for some limited purposes. It works in terms of our ability to communicate about our patients between providers. So actually, when we say, oh, I have a patient uh, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, the other uh, the person on the other end of the telephone line roughly knows what to expect when that patient appears in the office uh, a week later. Um, it also works in terms of billing, so it actually serves as a nice system for insurance companies to decide how much uh, to pay providers and what for. But it does not work for many of the other reasons we use diagnoses for in terms of prediction of treatment, prediction of longitudinal course, although it probably does a little bit better at that. Um, and importantly for research perspective, the underlying biology. One of the reasons, of course, is that um, uh, what, what one of the best illustrations, I think, of, of how inadequate our diagnoses are is this graph, which is um, a, a plot of, of uh, individuals of a, a few hundred, in this case, children, although the plot would look identical for adults or nearly identical, um, children who present for psychiatric care to a clinic, and they get uh, what's a, a very, very thorough, structured interview to try to figure out what diagnoses they have. And uh, each circle here represents um, the, uh, one particular diagnosis, and so each point on this circle uh, it represents individuals with that diagnosis if they're inside the circle, and what you can see is that these circles overlap. That is that the, 
that it is the rule rather than the exception that a child presenting for mental health treatment has multiple diagnoses. Do we really think that child has multiple things wrong with the brain? It's possible. But isn't it also, in fact, I would argue it's more, more likely that our diagnoses are overlapping, not because individuals have multiple things wrong, but because we don't yet know how to categorize what's going wrong well enough to do that. A third challenge we have in psychiatry is that of biomarkers. So uh, what is a biomarker? A biomarker is some biological value that we can measure that helps us clinically in one way, shape, or form. So if you have a fever, you go to the doctor, they're going to draw blood, and they're going to measure your white blood cell count to see if you might have an infection, because people who have an infection generally have elevated white blood cell counts. If you go to a psychiatrist with depression, uh, yes, they might draw blood, but it's to rule out stuff that's so rare, it's really almost irrelevant. There's, and there's certainly n n virtually nothing that will help us guide our treatment decisions within the realm of psychiatry itself. Um, another purpose of, of biomarkers, rather than to predict a treatment response, is to follow the course of an illness. And this is an image here of uh, individuals with Alzheimer's disease, uh, one unaffected individual, three affected individuals, at increasing uh, uh, severity of their symptoms. And you can see in uh, the warmer colors are high levels of amyloid deposition in the brain. And you can see that amyloid deposition tracks the course of the illness. So you can follow whether or not an individual is progressing rapidly or slowly by following the amyloid. This, of course, also tells you something about the neurobiology, potentially, of the illness. We can see that there is amyloid in the brains, and we can then study what leads to the deposition of amyloid and maybe design some treatments based upon that, although my understanding of that hasn't worked out entirely perfectly. But we do understand something about the neurobiology of Alzheimer's from that. So um, we have high burden. Our diagnoses are inaccurate. Um, we don't have any way of tracking our patients or predicting whether they're going to respond to a given treatment. And our treatments, that's the holy grail of psychiatry, right? Because actually we do a good job of treating our patients. That's been the, the, the lore. And we do a fair job of treating many of our patients. But even in the best of situations where we have a number of different treatments to choose from, we don't do a good enough job. And this is best illustrated by some results of a rather large NIMH-funded study of depression treatments, where individuals started out the study. They were assigned to one particular treatment group. They got an antidepressant treatment. If they didn't respond, they wanted to a different one, didn't respond. Stage step three and step four, they went on to further and further treatments. And um, what you can see is that on the first treatment, about a third of patients will respond with a robust improvement. Um, the second treatment, you'll get another 20 or 30 percent. But you max out, even after exhausting four different antidepressants, at about 70 percent of individuals with, with, uh, with uh, what we call remission, which is complete resolution of the symptoms. So that's pretty good, but not good enough, right? Because it means a third of our patients are not getting better with this medication. And there's uh, um, the other uh, worse thing about it, though, is even when the treatments work, they don't last all that well. They don't actually work in the long term. This is uh, not this is this is all comers. So it's not just those who've re achieved remission that seventy percent. But if you look at the percentage of people who uh, relapse within a year. Even after the, you know, they go through these treatments, you can see that between a half and three quarters of individuals uh, in, in, who started out this study will have a second episode within a year, right? So a large fraction of those who get well actually relapse. And so our treatments, when they work, they don't work long enough or well enough. So those are the challenges. Um, we got uh, heavy burden, poor diagnoses, no biomarkers, and inadequate treatments. So why the heck would I take this job? <laughs> and, and the reason why is because I actually am really optimistic about our ability to turn the corner on some of these issues. And, and why? Well, there's a number of opportunities that we have that are really, um, that have the potential to transform psychiatry. And one of those is, is, is genetics. So if I had been up here talking to you about psychiatric genetics five years ago, and I said, oh, this is an opportunity, you would have laughed me off the stage because we didn't really have anything, despite many, many years and many, many millions of dollars um, 
of trying. But in the last five years, there's really been a revolution in terms of the uh, understanding of the genetic basis of psychiatric disorders. And we now, this says 108, but the latest data are 180. There are 180 places in the genome that are associated with schizophrenia. We have dozens, literally dozens of high impact mutations which influence uh, your uh, likelihood to get autism. We're starting to see some, uh, some hits for, uh, for depression and OCD. Uh, and PTSD. So we're starting to get our, an understanding of the genetic uh, liability to contract this disorders, which is only one of the etiologic factors, uh, but it's an important one that gives us clues into the neurobiology. Um, I'm also excited about something that I know is going on here a lot, which is uh, the theoretical and computational approaches that are maturing and that have the potential to really impact the field of psychiatry. And uh, we'll talk more about it for those of you who come to the panel this afternoon. But um, this accompanies multiple different facets of bringing these approaches to psychiatry, including um, what many people think about in terms of you know large data sets and data mining and being able to do uh, to, to do, use deep learning methods to extract. Uh, uh, reliable information from large complex data sets, but also biophysical modeling of how the brain works, um, comp what we call computational phenotyping, which is trying to understand what are the computations that the brain needs to compute to accomplish specific behaviors, designing behaviors that that give you accurate measurements of those computations, and then trying to uh, figure out what are the neural substrates underlying those computations. So uh, all these different approaches have the potential to transform our understanding of how the brain works, and if applied to psychiatric problems, to improve our ability to treat patients. And then the third one that I want to mention is uh, circuit neuroscience. And this is another revolution that's really happened in the last decade or so, where we've developed, at least in mice, the capacity to deeply understand um, the role of really with exquisite specificity, specific neuronal subtypes, specific projections, specific pathways, specific circuits, complex behaviors. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the explosion in knowledge that that gives you in terms of the, uh, of where to look for deficits in psychiatric disorders. And you put these things together, genetics that can define some of the biological substrates, um, computational analyses and approaches that will allow you to figure out, well, what are those substrates trying to do? And then uh, circuit neuroscience that give you the ability to test those hypotheses in really robust ways. And we have the potential to make a big difference in psychiatry. OK. so. Um, I, I ended with the circuit. I ended with the circuit on purpose because uh, it, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we've used these circuit approaches to understand biology of relevance to psychiatric disorders. And I'm, again, I'm going to tell you two stories. The first one is, a, is really a genetic story uh, or combines genetics and circuits. And then the second one is a circuit specific one. So, um, so if we go back from the 108 loci or 108 for schizophrenia and we think more globally about how do we understand uh, psychiatric illnesses and how do we model them in model organisms, you need some biologic clue to be able to say, oh, the thing that I'm studying in this organism may be relevant to human psychiatric disease. And there are lots of those clues that, are, that have been used over time to try to build models in, in animals where you can really study in depth the nervous system. And the one that I chose to start out with uh, um, in my career was were, were these genetic clues. And uh, the idea, the simple-minded idea back then, which has, of course, since gotten much more complicated, was that you have a mutation or, uh, which leads to a disease phenotype. And you want to try to understand how does that mutation lead to the disease phenotype. Of course, genes don't code for behaviors. They code for molecules, right? Uh, molecules which affect cellular processes. So if you want to understand how a gene mutation leads to a disease phenotype, um, you need to understand how that mutation affects the neuron, the, cell of the, the cells of the brain, how those neurons wire together into a circuit and how that circuit function is affected by the mutation, how those circuits wire themselves together into whole neural systems and how they produce behavior and how all of this process is altered by the mutation of interest. Now, you need this for, yes, a full neurobiologic understanding of how that gene leads to behavior. But there's another reason why you need this multiple level understanding, and that is because in psychiatry, we do not know where the next treatment is going to come from. Most of our treatments in psychiatry are leveraged in two locations, 
One at the level of the cell where we target receptors or second messenger things or mostly receptors to tell you the truth and transporters that, that uh, uh, affect the behaviors that we study. Uh, there's another set of treatments though that actually are aimed at the level of behavior, right? Psychosocial treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy and the like uh, that have real genuine impact on psychiatric disease. There are beginning to be some treatments that are aimed at the level of the system. So we have transcranial magnetic stimulation, deep brain stimulation, et cetera. And so uh, we can imagine that interventions at any one of these levels might work to help our illnesses. So we really want to thoroughly understand the progression from gene to behavior because we don't know where this new information that we can get from the genes is going to help us design new treatments. So for those two reasons, thorobiological understanding and we don't know where our treatment's going to come from, it's important to understand this entire pathway. So, uh, of course, that's a big ask. And I already told you there's lots and lots of genes uh, or places in the genome that we think are relevant to schizophrenia. Where does one start? I chose to start for various reasons with, the 20, with a particular microdeletion syndrome, which leads to an increased risk for psychotic, uh, uh, psychotic syndrome, which is otherwise indistinguishable from schizophrenia. This syndrome is called the 22Q11 microdeletion syndrome because it's a microdeletion on chromosome 22. You're missing about 24 genes in the human genome. And uh, if you are unlucky enough to have this mutation, you have about a 30% chance of getting schizophrenia. Compare that to the base rate of 1%. That's a 30-fold increase. By the way, most of those other 180 loci, we're not talking about anywhere near as big an increase. Instead of a 30-fold, it might be a 20% increase or a 1.2-fold for the biggest impact of those other 180 loci. So this is a different kind of genetic contributor with high penetrance. If you look in schizophrenia clinics, estimates range from a half percent to 2%. So we can take an average, say about 1% of patients with schizophrenia have this microdeletion. Uh, and the microdeletion is associated with working memory deficits, and fortunately, 22 of those 24 genes lie next to each other on mouse chromosome 16. So several different groups, including that of my longtime collaborator, Joseph Gogos and Maria Kariorgu, uh, made mouse models of this central deletion region and uh, examine behavior. So that's the gen gene that we're gonna, that my work focused on. What about the disease phenotype? Well, um, I wasn't brave enough, although others now are, to tackle the issue of why someone, of, of hallucinations in a mouse or delusions in a mouse. So I chose instead the cognitive symptoms that are associated with both the microdeletion and generic schizophrenia. And so I chose to study working memory. How do you study working memory in a mouse? Um, the, the behavior test we used was a very simple TMAs delayed non-matched to sample test. It's called that because there's three phases, a sample, a delay, and choice phase. During the sample phase, the animal's instructed of which arm on the TMAs to go to to retrieve a reward by the presence of a wall. So it only has one way to go, gets a reward. There's a delay. It has to remember where it went in the sample phase. And then faced with the decision of which arm to go to, it must execute an action to go to the opposite arm. Very, very simple test. Mice. Uh, without this microdeletion, learn the task in about three, four days of 10 trials a day. Uh, mice with the microdeletion take longer, on average, about two to three days longer to learn the task. Actually, by the end of their training, they do just as well as wild types, so they can execute the task well, but they have an acquisition deficit. So that's the behavior I'm trying to explain with the microdeletion. So how does one go about this? Um, well, for many reasons, not the least of which is it's for me, it was the most interesting. I, I started at the level of neural systems. We already knew something about what neural systems are important for the accomplishment of this TMAs behavior, um, thanks to the work of lots of neuroscientists who showed that if you lesion or silence the hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex, particularly the medial prefrontal cortex, particularly the prelimbic region within the medial prefrontal cortex, um, you disrupt behavior in this task, both actually performance and expression. If you disconnect them through uh, uh, any number of manipulations, one of which I will show you later, you also disrupt performance and acquisition in this task. So um, uh, the idea is that these two structures must work together to accomplish the task. So we asked, do they work together in mice and do they uh, work together in the mutant to mouse. So we put electrodes into these two brain regions, recorded neural activity simultaneously from the two of them, and looked at 
Yes, activity in either brain region alone, which I can say grossly was normal, so we, I'm not going to talk about that today, but also the degree to which neural activity in the two regions synchronize with each other as a proxy for how well the two brain regions are working together or talking together. How do we do that? Well, neural activity in the hippocampus conveniently goes up and down and up and down and up and down in a rather regular rhythmic oscillation over time. And the bulk of that oscillation is, uh, the bulk of the energy of that oscillation is happening at a particular frequency range around the theta frequency, or 8 hertz. And we can record simultaneously the activity of individual neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And those neurons seem to occur, at least in this recording, at a particular phase of that oscillatory cycle. They seem to be occurring as the oscillation makes its upward swing in the hippocampus. So these are individual neurons in the prefrontal cortex, bulk activity called a local field potential in the, in the hippocampus, and they seem to be synchronized. So it, it, how could they synchronize? Multiple ways. The most convenient way would be as if they're talking to each other. And indeed, what you can show is in a given neuron, most of the spikes of that neuron do occur at a particular phase of the theta cycle, that upward swing. And if you record from lots of neurons in the prefrontal cortex of a mouse while it's doing your working memory task, you find that about 60% or so of the neurons in the prefrontal cortex are statistically significantly synchronized to that theta oscillation of the hippocampus. And we call this synchrony phase locking because it's as if the neurons are locked in phase to the hippocampal oscillation. We look at the strength of that phase locking in each neuron, and we compare that average strength in the wild-type animals to the mutant animals. They're both engaged in the task. It's after training, so they're doing equally well. We see that the mutants have weaker phase locking than their wild-type litter mates. And that's true regardless of what phase of the task you're in. It's also true, by the way, at baseline before the animals are actually trained. So it seems like our mutants have deficits in the ability of the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex to communicate with each other. There's a disruption in this hippocampal prefrontal system that uh, we think might lead to the behavior. Well, what about the circuit element that might subserve that? Well, it turns out that the hippocampus sends direct monosynaptic projections to the prefrontal cortex, predominantly from its ventral region. So we wanted to test whether that particular circuit element was important for working memory. So we stepped away from the mutants for a while. We'll get back to them. But we stepped away from them for a while to test if we disrupt this connection, do we disrupt behavior? And here's where we applied neural circuit level technology. So we take a virus which carries the gene for a bacterial protein called enhanced ARCH3.0. And uh, the ARCH protein is a proton pump that pumps protons out of the cell when exposed to light. So if we shine light on example, neurons that are expressing the ARCH, um, they will pump protons out of the cell, hyperpolarize, make it more difficult for them to fire action potentials. But we're not shining light on the hippocampal neurons. We actually shine light on the tips of the the prefrontal cortex itself. So we're not turning off the whole hippocampus. We're only turning off, not quite turning off, but we're only inhibiting the neurons that are actually projecting to the prefrontal cortex. So we're getting rid of this very specific circuit element, the connection from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, and this particularly this monosynaptic direct projection. What happens when we do that during behavior? Well, if we shine the light during the whole trial, or during the sample trial, in red, you can see the turning sample phase of the trial, the encoding phase of the trial. In red, you can see that in, you get uh, behavioral deficits when you inhibit this hippocampal to prefrontal projection. Only in animals that are expressing our arch protein, not in animals that are expressing a control protein here in gray. So we can, when we can inhibit this projection and we disrupt performance in the TMA's task. So that suggests indeed that this circuit element could, like the deficits in this circuit element, this direct hippocampal prefrontal projection, could underlie disconnection between the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex and deficits in behavior. And I don't, didn't show this, but we showed in the paper that indeed you disrupt phase locking, uh, uh, at least in a different frequency range, um, by disrupting this one connection. So if that's the case, then it opens, leaves open the question, okay, is that circuit element disrupted? And why would that circuit element be disrupted in the mutant mice? So now I'm going to tell you a level at the work of the cell that was really conducted in, in my collaborator's lab, in Joseph's lab, by Jun Wu Kai, a uh, postdoc. And um, uh, what, what Jun did was he took uh, first neurons, 
um, from um, mutant and wild type mice and grew them up in a dish in culture and watched the from those neurons in culture grow out. And he saw deficits in the mutant elaboration of these dendrites. Then he labeled up these neurons actually in vivo uh, in animals, in mutant animals and wild type animals, and that's what I'm showing you here. I'm actually showing you corticocortical axons from one prefrontal cortex to the other, but the same thing that I'm showing here is also true for the hippocampal cortical axons that we've been, we just studied optogenetically. What we found in these axons is that mutants lacking the either one gene with this in region, which I'll talk about in a moment, CDHHC8, or the entire region, have decreased branching in their uh, glutamatergic long-range connectivity axons compared to wild-type mice. And uh, it's actually quite a substantial reduction in the number and complexity of the branching of these neurons. Um, and that was true, as I said, in this very circuit element we had just studied and showed to be important for working memory, so in that hippocampal to prefrontal projection. Um, what was going on at the level of the cell that created this? Well, by careful biochemical studies of the axons in vitro, he was able to show that there was dysregulation of a kinase, GSK3 beta, in these axons as a result, that was a result of a loss of this one particular gene within this brain region. And the, uh, and he was able to show that that was causally related to the axon outgrowth because if he antagonized this kinase, so the kinase was two axons, if he antagonized this kinase, he rescued the axonal outgrowth phenotype. So that work suggested the, this overarching hypothesis that deletion of this microdeletion region in a mouse probably due to the loss of this one gene, or, or at least contributing factor is this loss of this one gene, ZDHHC8, leads to deficits in axonal branching, including axonal branching of the hippocampal to prefrontal projection, which then disconnects the hippocampus to prefrontal cortex and leads to cognitive deficits. So how, the question is, how could we test that hypothesis? And fortunately, June and Joseph gave us the magic bullet that allowed us to test the hypothesis, at least to provide some initial evidence that this hypothesis could be true because we could biochemically rescue the axonal branching deficits and then ask whether that rescues the systems and behavioral level phenotypes. So that's what Makoto Tamura, postdoc in my lab, did. He treated mice through the early period of, well, not really early, through four weeks of postnatal development with an antagonist, the same antagonist that June showed reverses the axonal outgrowth deficits, waited three months for them to grow up, implanted them electrodes, put them in the T maze, and this is the behavioral result on the left, Wild-type mice learn the task in four days. Mutant mice take a couple days longer. Mutant mice treated with the drug back to wild-type levels in terms of how quickly they can acquire the T-maze task. This is our phase-locking value, a different value than the one I showed before, a different computation, but the same thing. Theta frequency phase-locking in the mutants are, is weaker than in wild-types and rescued with our developmental reverse, uh, uh, reversal of this GSK3 beta hyperactivity. So it, we have now the at least some evidence suggests that this is a causal pathway by which the gene leads to its, at least its cognitive deficits. So that's the first story I wanted to tell you about. Um, and it, it focuses on uh, really understanding, if you will, the structure of particular circuit elements and demonstrating those circuit elements are important for a phenotype and that they are affected by the gene. Um, I want to tell you a second story, uh, which is less about the structure of a particular circuit element and rather about the pattern of activity that might take place. And this results to our, this, this work came out of our, our related work on this same projection, the hippocampal to prefrontal projection and its importance for anxiety-like behavior in a rodent. And a particular one form of anxiety-like behavior, anxiety-like avoidance of open spaces in the environment, um, which I'm going to tell you about from one particular test called the elevated plus maze test today, another relatively simple behavioral test. So mice will naturally avoid the open arms of a plus-shaped maze elevated off the ground, two of the arms being enclosed in high walls, two of the arms are open. So again, mice tend to avoid those open arms, but they do make forays out into the open arms. And uh, we think that uh, this avoidance is essentially a, a a signal of the animal's conflict between its desire to explore the entirety of its environment, because there might be goodies out there that it wants, and the animal's tendency to try to avoid predation, because, of course, it's much safer. Hawks can't swoop down and get it, et cetera, when it's in these enclosed arms. Uh, 
And you can show that anxiolytics, drugs like Valium, uh, increase the amount of time animals spend in the open arms, and um, anxiogenics, drugs like yohimbine, will uh, decrease the amount of time spent in the open arms. And there's lots of other evidence accumulated, again, over years of research to suggest that actually this behavior may be relevant for human psychiatric disorders. Um, but for the purpose of today, what we're really trying to figure out is what's the neural circuitry underlying this particular behavior and whether it's relevant for human anxiety disorders, like we can leave for another discussion. So it turns out, as I said, hippocampal prefrontal interactions are important for this behavior as well as the teammate's behavior. And, uh, and we can show that through many ways, one of which would be that we put animals in the elevated plus maze and we measure the strength of phase locking of the prefrontal neurons to the hippocampus. And you can see that um, that phase locking, which is the, you know, the concentration of spikes from a particular prefrontal cortical neuron to a particular phase of the hippocampal oscillation is stronger, right? This peak is higher and this peak is lower than in a familiar environment here in black. So, um, and, and that increases about a, a 1.2 fold increase, about a 20% increase in the strength of phase locking um, when you put the animals into the plus maze compared to in a familiar environment. So, um, we then ask the same question, since this hippocampal synchrony is important for, uh, or seems to be engaged, sorry, not important, engaged in um, anxiety-related avoidance of the open arms, uh, if we disrupt this hippocampal prefrontal projection, do we disrupt um, TMA's performance? Uh, so the first thing that we did, and this was work done by a graduate student in the lab, uh, Nancy Padilla-Coriano, um, was look at if disrupting this projection actually disrupts theta frequency synchrony. So here's uh, each dot here is a neuron, and on the x-axis is the strength of that phase locking with the light off, and on the y-axis is the strength of phase locking on the light on, and you can see that most of these points, particularly the green ones, which are the ones that are statistically significantly phase locked in the first place, lie below the line. That is, that phase locking strength is higher with the light off than with the light on. So you turn on the lights, you inhibit that projection, and you decrease the ability of the, sorry, you decrease the phase locking of the prefrontal neurons to hippocampal theta oscillation. And in fact, you, you pretty much get out in arch animals and, and you um, have no effect on animals that aren't expressing the opposite. What about behavior? So here's the percentage time in the open arms. More time in the open arms means less anxious. If you inhibit that projection in animals that have the opposite, not in control animals, you increase the amount of time spent in the open arms. You make the animals less anxious. You turn it off and on and off and on and you get the effect. So this projection is important for uh, avoidance of the open arms. And it's important for the synchrony that we observe in the elevated plus maze. Um, but, you know, I, I told you a while back, uh, the, right, that this is a, a, f uh, um, a synchrony in a particular frequency range, the synchrony to theta frequency oscillations. And in fact, at least in the anxiety-provoking environment, the, the, the issue is more complex in the working memory condition, but in the anxiety condition, um, the increase in synchrony is very, very specific to the state of frequency range. You don't see increases in the plus maze to, to these oscillations in other frequency ranges. And it begged the question, are these interactions that are occurring at the state of frequency range, is that meaningful? Is it important that it's occurring in that frequency range? Or is that frequency range simply a marker of what's going on in the system? And what's really important is the increase in connections, the increase in connectivity, the increase in information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. So um, Nancy wanted to test that, and the way she chose to test it was to try to increase anxiety by stimulating this pathway. Now, this kind of experiment has worked over and over again in the anxiety field. There are other places in the brain, for example, the amygdala, where you can block activity and reduce anxiety and increase activity and increase anxiety. But in the amygdala and these other places, the dynamics don't seem to matter. You can just increase activity by pulsing randomly. You can increase activity by giving a drug that just overall increases the excitability of, of amygdala neurons. You can increase it through actually electrical stimulation, and you get much the same thing. But we had a hypothesis here that the dynamics would matter and that maybe the theta frequency is really important. So Nancy chose to stimulate this pathway three different ways. One is to induce in these terminals, an oscillation that mimics the natural oscillation of the hippocampus. It's still artificial, it's exogenous, but it mimics the ongoing oscillation in the hippocampus. 
or at that same frequency, deliver sharp pulses eight times a second, or the oscillatory stimulation at a different frequency, 20 hertz. Now, I do have to explain a little bit more why these two methods, the pulse method or the oscillation method. Well, if one thinks about information flow in the nervous system, this pulse method is a little bit strange. Why? Because if you shine a bright light in a pulse, what you're doing is taking all of the axons that go from here to there and activating them all precisely at once. And we know that's happening neurobiologically. You can measure it, right? So you're getting this volley of information eight times a second that's meaningless, right? It has nothing to do with the behavior. But we reason that maybe by inducing an oscillation in these uh, axons, what you're, you're not actually causing massive simultaneous activity in the pathway, but you're simply modulating it. And maybe that's going to do something a little bit different. And, and I wouldn't be telling you if it didn't. And, and we'll try to figure out what it might be doing specifically. And then, of course, we have the different frequency to see if theta frequency really matters. So uh, same paradigm we did for the inhibition. Put the animals in the plus maze, turn the, leave the light off for two minutes, on, off, and on. Except instead of continuous light to inhibit, you're giving these three different patterns of activity in three different sets of animals. So we have control mice that are not expressing uh, the opsin, you have mice expressing channel road opsin now, an excitatory bacterial protein. When you shine light, it activates things. But again, we're shining light on the terminals and on the cell bodies. And the first thing we did was measure behavior to see whether we should bother with doing any more of these experiments. So uh, if you turn on an oscillatory sine wave at 8 hertz, you do the opposite to inhibition. Remember, inhibition increased the percentage of open time, the amount of time the animals spent on the open arms. Excitation decreases it. So that's sort of what we expected, the opposite effect. But if we do the typical thing that is pulse activation, we don't actually see a behavioral effect. And if we oscillate those terminals 20 times a second instead of 8 times a second, we also don't see an effect. So this suggested, number one, that frequency matters, that this hippocampal to prefrontal system might be somehow specialized to receive information at this theta frequency, at this 8 hertz frequency that is the natural frequency of the pathway. The other thing it suggested, though, is that this sine wave is really doing something genuinely different than the pulses. And then the question that we had to ask was, well, what is it doing? So Nancy turned to a, a, a postdoc in Christoph Kellendonk's lag, Sarah Canetta, to look at what happens with these stimulation paradigms at the level of the synapse by using an in vitro preparation, a slice preparation. So she put channel rhodopsin into those hippocampal neurons, took slices from the prefrontal cortex, and recorded from prefrontal cortical pyramidal neurons with a, a whole cell patch clamp, and stimulated with light. So she's stimulating just these hippocampal inputs onto those prefrontal neurons. And this is recordings of the uh, current in those prefrontal neurons. And what you can see is when you pulse activate these inputs, you'd see what you should expect to see. That is, each pulse evokes a postsynaptic response. That's this downward current here. Each and every pulse invokes a downward current in the prefrontal cortical neuron. And indeed, that lasts for as long as we tried, which is you know two minutes, as long as we did it for behavior. 20 hertz pulses, though, don't do that. If you pulse 20 times a second, you see that there's not these responses to each one of these light pulses. So already we actually have learned something. This synapse seems to be specialized in some way that permits 8 hertz information to get through, but not 20 hertz information to get through. Doesn't explain why the pulses don't do their thing, but it explains why 8 hertz. And we know, by the way, that channel rhodopsin in hippocampal neurons follows 20 hertz stimulation. So it's not some artifact of our molecule that we use that it can't follow these pulses. All right, what happens with the sine wave stimulation? Well, what you can see is that there's not distinct pulses at any one of these phases. Instead, what it looks like is an increase in the rate of these smaller responses, which are basically spontaneous currents, spontaneous, what we call spontaneous evoked, uh, spontaneous postsynaptic currents. Um, that's what it looks like anyway. And 20 hertz sine wave does that a little bit as well, but not as much. And we know that they're actually this synapse because, or at least the glutamatergic synapse, because we can wipe it out with antagonists to glutamate receptors. So what we see then in the 8 hertz pulses is we evoke large amplitude 8 hertz responses in the prefrontal cortex. In 8 hertz sine waves, we evoke an increase in the frequency of responses, but they're not larger. 
their spontaneous level. And 20 hertz, also an increase, a more modest increase in the frequency, no increase in the size. So it looks like our oscillatory stimulation is increasing the ability of these hippocampal neurons to release neurotransmitter onto the prefrontal cortical neurons, but not actually evoking any activity themselves. Well, we wanted to know, does this happen in vivo, right? Because one possibility is the reason why our oscillatory stimulus is working is because it's allowing information through from the hippocampus more than there was uh, without the oscillatory stimulation. So we wanted to test that directly. So Nancy put a stimulating electrode into the hippocampus. So she can evoke action potentials in the hippocampal neurons. They'll travel down the axons and then invade those axon terminals where we're shining our light and evoke responses in the prefrontal cortex. And indeed, you get responses in prefrontal cortical neurons. This is a these are all the spikes timed to the stimulation in the hippocampus, and each line represents a spike from that prefrontal cortical neuron. You add them up over multiple trials, and you can see that you get a modest increase in the rate of a neuron's activity by stimulating the hip in the prefrontal cortex by stimulating the hippocampus. You turn on our 8 hertz sine wave stimulation, and you boost that. So the sine wave does indeed allow information to, tr to flow better through this hippocampal prefrontal synapse. 8 hertz signs do it better than 20 hertz signs, and it has to have the arch protein. Now, if that's true, then what, the question then becomes, does the oscillation matter, or is it simply depolarizing the terminals, making that transmission easier? And it turns out oscillation matters, and why do we know that? Because the prefrontal cortical neurons become phase-locked to the light stimulus, right? So this is the strength of phase locking to the light stimulus. This is without the options. You can see this is bigger than that. So we can entrain those neurons. We can phase lock those prefrontal cortical neurons to our light stimulus, to our artificial light stimulus. We can do it at 8 hertz. We can do it at 20 hertz. But here's the kind of cool thing, I think, anyway. That entrainment works better in the plus maze than in a familiar environment. So we're taking our mice. We're doing this artificial stimulation. We're asking, do the prefrontal cortical neurons respond to this artificial stimulation? The answer is yes, they do it better to 8 hertz than 20 hertz. Again, our synapse is frequency specific. But there is a frequency specific potentiation of that entrainment, of the ability of our artificial stimulus to drive prefrontal cortical neurons when you put them in the plus maze. So there's two things going on in the plus maze when we're doing this optical stimulation. Number one, the synapse is better able to respond to 8 hertz. Number two, that better able to stimulate at 8 hertz is increased by something else that's happening in the animal, some behavioral state-dependent process, maybe neuromodulation, maybe the activity of a different input we don't know. OK, there's what, yet there's one more thing. I feel like I'm Steve Jobs. <laughs> It turns out not just that hippocampal prefrontal synapse is entrained to this artificial light oscillation. This is a tracing of the local field potential in the hippocampus, and it looked eerily as if this light we're giving to the prefrontal cortex is somehow driving activity in the hippocampus. And indeed, what you can see using a measure called coherence, which is the degree to which the light oscillation lines up with the local field potential oscillation, there's increased coherence, at, particularly at this 8 hertz range, when we turn on the light compared to when we don't have the light on. Well, sorry, that's not right. This is, sorry, that wouldn't make any sense. This is arch animals. This is EYP animals. So there is, we can evoke, if you will, an artificial theta oscillation in the hippocampus by stimulating the prefrontal cortical terminals of those neurons. And it takes about five seconds before that works. And why that's important is because backpropagation for the aficionados should work immediately, and it doesn't. So what we think is happening is that the whole circuit is now gets entrained to the light, that we're engaging this reverberant circuit that goes throughout the brain, or at least through the parts of the brain that are engaged, so that not only are we, one, facilitating this 8 hertz synaptic transmission, two, engaging some natural mechanism that happens when we put the animal in the plus maze, but three, we're actually driving hippocampal activity so that the hippocampal inputs are actually timed to get to the prefrontal cortex when our light is on.
How do we know that? We can now look at the phase locking of prefrontal cortical neurons to the hippocampal local field potential when the light is on versus the light is off, and you see a big increase, only to 8 hertz, not to 20 hertz. So we are doing multiple things with our artificial stimulation, and it's telling us multiple things. Number one, this synapse is specialized for 8 hertz. 8 hertz matters. Number two, there is some ability of the whole circuit to entrain at 8 hertz that's not there at 20 hertz. And number three, if we can enhance information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, we enhance anxiety. All those three things in this one experiment. And there's a fourth thing that's a cautionary tale for any kind of neurostim. It is you think the reason why you have your behavioral effect is you're doing something right here at the level of the hippocampal prefrontal synapse, but really you have widespread effects throughout the brain. We don't know how much of the brain, but at least engaging these. And by the way, this back projection is at least two, three synapses. So, okay. So, neural activity, the sum is that when you probe cervical dynamics, you find out that dynamics matter. And um, I don't know. Okay. So now I want to turn towards this final part, which is translating. So, hopefully, you've got the impression that we can use neural circuit, circuit technologies to learn a lot about how both the genes and the circuits in the brain alter psychiatrically relevant behaviors. And that was the whole point besides me just, you know, egotistically telling you about my research so you can think it's cool. Um, question is then, how do we translate that knowledge into information that's useful in the clinic? And I think there are basically two approaches that we can use. One I'm going to call the neurobiologic approach, and the other is the technological approach. And I, at least at the level of the NIMH, we need to pursue both. Uh, the neurobiologic approach, what do I mean there? Well, I've sort of been talking about that the whole time uh, with my science. Let's see if we can understand something about the circuit that would allow us to then manipulate that circuit using some therapy. Maybe it's GSK3 beta antagonism. Maybe it's uh, a neurostim treatment that will increase hippocampal to prefrontal theta synchrony. But learn something neurobiologically that we can harness. But the problem is that myself above anyone else, that we're all not doing this in the neural circuit field. Um, those of us who use neural circuit technology in mice are happy, unfortunately, to dissect the circuit out, figure out which circuit elements are important, and then move on to another circuit element. What we really need to do is study the biological characteristics of any specific circuit element so that we can figure out how we would intervene. How could we increase hippocampal to prefrontal neural transmission in humans. Well, one way is potentially stimulating it. We'll get to there in a minute. But maybe there's some panoply of ion channels in the prefrontal cortex that allow it to respond preferentially at 8 hertz. And if we gave a drug that agonized some or antagonized others, we might enhance that transmission. Or in the case of anxiety, you might want to diminish it. We need molecular elements maybe that are specifically expressed in a particular circuit of cell type. So maybe if we had some uh, receptor that's mostly expressed in hippocampal neurons, then we could activate that receptor and enhance hippocampal to prefrontal transmission. Maybe it's a presynaptic receptor. Maybe it's a presynaptic receptor that's predominantly expressed on the hippocampal to prefrontal projection. But we won't know that unless we look for it, and believe me, we're not looking for it now. Physiological and anatomical characteristics can also be used, not just molecular. So for example, Maybe, I talked about theta, maybe we can use a theta stimulation-based approach that will affect anxiety. What I didn't tell you is that the working memory connectivity that's important for actually remembering, uh, encoding into memory, the information you need for that TMACE task is not a theta, it's a gamma. So if we altered theta, we could potentially help with anxiety without interfering with working memory. So the bottom line is that purposeful examination of these specific circuit elements implicating these specific behaviors is required if we want to develop these kinds of information and use a neurobiologic approach to figure out ways of intervening. Then there's the technology approach. And there, the idea here is very simple. We have these technologies. They work in mice. Maybe they would work in humans. You can imagine defining the specific circuit elements in the human, directing specific expression of neuromodulators to those neurons using the right target vectors, determining which kind of modulation you want to use, and then you want to minimize invasiveness. People have thought about this a lot, but the one big problem people haven't thought about enough is that this is the size of a mouse brain compared to the human. 
And I can, it took 12 injections per side for Tim Spellman and Nancy Padilla, who worked on that technique, to label up fully the ventral hippocampus. That's the ventral, this is the anterior part of the hippocampus in the human. Like, we need vectors that, in fact, bigger chunks of tissue. Let's just start there. We also need, vec we also need better explanation of this prefrontal cortex, which really is impoverished in a mouse. So we, we need intermediate models. We need intermediate models from the perspective of size and from the perspective of the presence of circuit elements that we just don't really have in a mouse. That probably means primate. We also need ability to direct specific expression. Most genes are expressed in specific cells either by localized injection or by, even more so, uh, transgenic animals that express proteins that allow you to limit expression of your gene to one particular cell type. We don't have that in humans. We are not going to make transgenic humans and breed them to help other people. But so we need mechanisms, to, and one mechanism is enhancers. There are others that you could put into viruses that might infect, that you could then inject specifically so you have only certain cell types. Another method, though, which is promising, would be to get viruses that actually you can inject into the bloodstream that then find their way into the cell and then bind and infect only specific cell types or direct specific expression. And this is stuff that people are working on now. Okay. Then you got to figure out what you want to do when you do that. There's lots of different ways to do it. You can do it optogenetically. You can do it with a drug. The idea is you want to try to develop as minimum an invasiveness procedure as possible for two reasons. One, if we can avoid drilling holes in people's skulls, we should probably do it. Number two, prevalence rate of psychiatric disorders is 20%. Let's suppose even only one-tenth of them or one-fiftieth of them were uh, needed a circuit, an invasive circuit technology. There aren't enough neurosurgeons. So anyway, that's a long way of saying, I'll just make one more point about this. So it sounds science fiction-y, and it's a little scary. But we have to remember what I said at the outset, which is the burden of our illnesses is tremendous and growing. And if we need it, there are lots and lots of people out there who are suffering so severely they would not think at us twice about a heroic intervention if it really works. The only way to find out if it really works is to start beginning to ask the question of how you would change things and testing it in more and more relevant animals. And at the very least, developing these technologies for the primate will help us translate the neurobiologic approach better and will set the stage for allowing us to do this in humans. So with that, I'll remind you about the mission. And I'm sorry I got to the end of the hour a few minutes late, but happy to take questions. Um, so the sine, the, the Averitt sine wave stuff is fascinating. Um, so you mentioned Arch a few times, but that was Channel Robson? Yeah, it's Channel Robson. Okay. It was CHR2. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Channel Robson. Yeah. Um, so uh, what was the other question? Oh, so that... Um, so talking about the 8 hertz sine waves here. So that's the uh, modulation of the intensity of the light. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's actually a lot more light than the pulses, but just as much as the 20 hertz. We could take it from zero to, I think it's five milliwatts um, in a sine wave. So it's essentially a 50% duty cycle, but no sharp boundaries. And is that what you think happens with dreads? Um, so is there, there's an idea that people have you know, where, where the, the dread, which is just sort of in boosting activity um, you know, slightly, um, I wonder if those would work just as well. If you they any they about might, that. because they might allow the endogenous theta oscillation to be better propagated. I would guess that they would work, um, uh, but, but, but I don't know. And you couldn't test different frequencies that way, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so you the, could ask whether the dread facilitated 8 hertz more than right. it facilitated synchrony at other frequencies. Yeah. So the context dependence is a super. That is, the, I mean, yeah. That, to I me, that is the most that is amazing. Incredible. Thing. Yeah. That's really interesting. But but my question came back to when you, you measured the uh, the hippocampal uh, theta and you saw that that was in train. I mean, that is also super interesting. So um, and you mentioned that as a cautionary tale because you know you you're making this very specific manipulation. You're seeing something more general, but it could actually be a really useful thing, right? I mean, it could be that 
you don't need to be so specific about what you're hitting and you can you find out this way that you can do something much more general that would be maybe much easier to do with a non-invasive procedure. Right, so this is something that people have talked a lot about in the transcranial magnetic stimulation field, is finding a cortical target that will influence a subcortical target that you can't reach. So this would suggest that, yeah, you could do that. You could do it through an oscillatory stimulation paradigm at the very least. There are lots of other ways you could do it too. Um, the other thing is, is if you could harness these mechanisms and really engage an entire circuit in some sort of synchronous activation, you can imagine being able to harness heavy and plasticity mechanisms to strengthen that connection. Um, it's a little harder to imagine, but you might imagine multi-site stimulation that could weaken it, right? So this, that's why I wanted to emphasize when we're talking about translating circuit technology from a neurobiologic perspective, you're not just necessarily talking about identifying proteins. You're also identi trying to identify patterns of neural activity that you can imagine changing things uh, through plasticity or through stimulation that would, uh, that would uh, be nonetheless circuit-targeted. Thank you. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, this level of specificity is really exciting. And yet, as I'm um, listening from my lens as a clinical psychologist, um, I can't help but wonder um, what role there might be for behavioral interventions to alter circuit functioning. So that's actually in the same way that I just described for TMS. You, one could think about designing behavioral interventions that really definitively target circuit interventions. So, for example, the training you know that many of you here study, uh, cognitive training. Um, one could use, and I think people are using, neural circuit approaches, at least imaging approaches, to try to define what brain regions you're activating. And then if you knew those brain regions were deficient in your patient or in your model, then you could fine tune those behavioral interventions to try to activate that circuit. I thought you were gonna ask a different question, which is that it's not likely that many of our psychiatric illnesses actually are confined to a particular circuit. And I think that poses its own set of problems as well. Um, where you might need to think more holistically. So for example, in the schizophrenia example, I, I emphasized the axonal branching in the hippocampal to prefrontal connection. Why? Because that connection is probably important for its spatial working memory deficits. But I also told you that cortical, cortical axons are decreased in branching. So I think something there, what you really might m more need is that intervention like the GSK3 beta that's probably affecting axon outgrowth throughout the brain, and not to mention half a dozen other cellular processes, or maybe 10 times that. So my top three thoughts out of the hundred that you generated, um, integrated behavioral health is kind of an interesting way of providing mental health care. Who knew it meant me injecting a virus into somebody's brain? <laughs> but we are moving in that direction. Okay, can I respond to that real quick? It, it, sure. So we may be. And one thing that you need to think about is what, whatever method you're using to implicate the circuit, um, it's quite likely that we will that we can pair that. We've been discussing that uh, last 24 hours or so. We might need to, or at least we can, pair that with behavioral interventions that then strengthen the functionality of that circuit. So, you know, one can imagine if you did this in a patient with schizophrenia, and overnight they're not going to suddenly going to be able to balance their checkbook, right? But you might, if you could combine behavioral and neurobiologic-based approaches, of, then you could imagine enabling a circuit to learn new things. Yes, and, and so underline the word combine, because that's where we're going, combining different technologies, different approaches. Yes, it's very exciting. Um, you almost escaped uh, an hour-long presentation without using the word environment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was there, and I just want you to, to, us to reflect on it. It appears that the enhancement occurs in the plus circuit and and so environment somehow recruits something else that we have yet to understand that has to do with environment and so so yep. it, 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 you didn't use the word environment but i heard it <laughs> and i'm glad because i certainly didn't mean to exclude it i think that the, the, the problem of incorporating environment thus far and and is really a relative one a comparative one we know the entire genome 
we know that there's, you know, whatever, three billion opportunities for things to go wrong, but it's only three billion. And we don't know the exposome, which is the new term we use for what, what are the some things that the environment, can, some of the things that the environment can do. And my guess is it's more than three billion, but maybe not. Um, but even if it's not, we don't know it yet. So it's easier to talk about genetics and, and, the, and the biological properties. It, 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 falsely easier, but easier. Last one. Yeah. Um, I want to connect one of your early slides, which was kind of a Venn diagram of lots of different behaviors, which we use, which we call diagnoses, and 22Q11. So you're going to tell me that 22Q11 doesn't only produce psychosis. That's right. Yeah, so 22Q11 <laughs> is a perfect example of that Venn diagram. In my, my, I mean, not, I'm not advocating we change the diagnostic system just yet, but 22Q11 is a diagnosis. You have a cause, you have a pleiotropy of possible effects, they're heterogeneous, but they're well-defined. It's a diagnosis. You don't have this, that, and the other. You have 22Q11 syndrome, which leads to several different conditions, including stuff in the heart, stuff in the, in the, uh, the thymus, and stuff in the CNS. And the stuff in the CNS, you asked, includes autism, increased rate of autism, increased rate of schizophrenia, but the most prevalent is anxiety disorders. Virtually everyone with 22Q has elevated anxiety uh, quantitatively and meets criteria for an anxiety disorder. Yeah, um, I thought it was a really good talk. And I, uh, you focused a lot on the 8 hertz rhythm. And so I'm curious to what extent you see individual differences in, say, you know, 9 hertz or 6 hertz. Six hertz. Does one mouse respond better to one of those and you know how you might see that being played out because it, the theta rhythm you know spans several frequencies yeah. and so I'm, I'm curious if, if you guys see this in mice too and, and in, in different mice respond differently so in mice and in genetically identified mice which is the best I can explain and maybe Dave would want to comment on rats which you know at least most lab rats are not quite as genetically identical in genetically identical mice each each strain has a characteristic frequency, um, and it's slightly different from strain to strain, at which the hippocampus will normally oscillate. That frequency is tremendously dependent upon behavioral state. So you get a 4 to 5 hertz oscillation in the hippocampus when the animal's freezing in response to a fear cue. You get a 7 to 8 hertz oscillation in the mice when they are navigating their environment. But the precise frequency range within that 7 hertz range depends on two factors, the speed with which they're navigating in their environment and the place in the hippocampus you're measuring it from. So, so there's not one monolithic theta frequency, but there is, if you're in one place in the hippocampus in one behavioral state, there is a characteristic frequency that doesn't differ much from individual to individual in, within an ident genetically identical strain of mice. Now, where we do see individual differences, for example, um, is in the theta, in the hippocampal prefrontal connectivity in our mutants, not so much in the wild types. The wild types are relatively restricted range, but in our mutants, we see some animals with wild type levels of connectivity, and some some animals with with weaker connectivity. And in fact, the reason why I, I alluded to this earlier uh, uh, in an offhand remark, we we think that connectivity is actually relevant to the behavior is those animals with the weakest connectivity are also those animals that take the longest to learn the teammates task. So it seems like there is inter-individual variability. Whether that is relevant for the inter-individual variability that a particular 22Q person has to have any given phenotype, we don't know. But it, we could speculate and say that even with this genetically identical mouse strain and the same genetic lesion, there is inter-individual variability in this connectivity phenotype that actually correlates with behavior. So it's it's interesting to think about how that might arise. I just um, wanted to follow up a little bit on a data clarification question with respect to the 8 hertz stimulation, the sine wave versus the pulse. So it looked like what you were showing was sort of this holy grail of neuromodulation, that rather than entraining the network and destroying the information that's coded by cells, you're somehow enhancing the native computational properties of that circuit. So I had a couple questions about that. The first was the throughput metric that looked at functional linkage between hippocampus and PFC. Did you only get the benefit of linkage between those structures? Um, yeah, for the sign and not the pulse. Was it critical? Yes, yes. So that's not um, the 12th and um, so this is, this. there is an effect in the 20 hertz sign. It's weaker. Right. 
and there is no effect in the pulse. But you've got to ramp it up and, and ramp it down and, to let the information transmission occur in the network, uh, in you, the presence of stem. Yes. I mean, this 8 hertz pulse evokes spikes right. in the PFC neurons in vivo, just like it does in vitro. Right. But, but there's no residual, you know, before or after, there's no residual increase in throughput. Okay. So, oh, so then, um, two questions. So if, if anything, gonna, is this like decrease, which you might predict. But so anyway. if you were going to stimulate monkeys, for example, to try to get a parallel effect, would, would you think the same thing would apply to electrical stem? I mean, it's a different mechanism, very different synaptic yeah, mechanism. So, 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 I, mechanism. so my, my guess about what's going on based upon our, our data from in vitro and vivo is that this is really particular to depolarizing in a rhythmic fashion the, the terminals. Yeah. Right, because the and electrical too, stimulation, not. if it works on axons, not terminals, but axons, it's probably going to have to either evoke spikes in individual axons or not evoke spikes. And that, to me, that's more about adding noise. But right. we haven't tested that idea. Right. Great. Right. Thanks. <clears throat> Do we have time for one more? I'm sorry for the somewhat provoking question. Please, um, provoke. <clears throat> but uh, Thomas Insull, uh, back in May in Wired Magazine, um, had kind of a discouraging comment on his time in your office. And I wonder um, if we ought to interpret his comment that $20 billion of NIMH uh, funding didn't really move the needle on decreasing suicides or hospitalizations, whether we ought to look at that as somebody speaking from their own ego, uh, whether um, it may be that you know his relative change in professions might have impacted that, um, whether we have to look at that as being something that's a, a sad truth but that we're getting close. Uh, how do we look at that to not be discouraged? Right. So I think, you know, we were talking last night at dinner, some of us, about successes and failures. And, you know, if we think about the failures in psychiatry over the last decade, they're palpable failures of improving the clinical situation. And if we talk about the successes, at least the ones that I think about, they're palpable successes at increasing our technological capacity and knowledge base at the basic science level. So, and I think Tom was essentially saying that. Like, we, yes, we've made some, he didn't, that wasn't highlighted in the wire, but I bet you asked, yes, we've made a lot of progress in neuroscience, but it hasn't led to improvements in treatment. And Tom, when he took over, uh, perhaps unwisely so, said, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to see big improvements in these things. And he wasn't able to get us there. I don't have that hubris, so I'm not going to make predictions. I think there are some things that might be beneficial that we could do in 10 years, but, uh, but uh, so I think, um, and, and there are some very real issues that we probably could make progress on if we focus on them, and suicide prevention is one of those, and that, I don't, didn't talk about that today, but that is a particular priority of mine that was already a pro starting to be a priority in MH in the last two years of, of Tom's um, uh, tenure, and I think, I think what, what he was saying is, you know what, he moved the needle a little too far. That's my, if I, if I had to read that. And, and, and we should be paying attention to these current problems. That was certainly a message that I received from lots of people in the few months before and few months after I started this job, which is that you've got to pay attention to things like implementation of the ideas that we already know work of short-term solutions for the people who are suffering now. And I heard that message and as a psychiatrist appreciated that message. And so, uh, you know, am I optimistic they're going to be able to bend the needle on those issues? I don't know, but we're going to try. Um, that doesn't mean, but, you know, the, it, in my mind, though, it's those successes that I emphasize today, um, which are really at a science level, not at a clinical level, that I think are really going to bring about big change. It's just a question of how many years it's going to take. And I don't mind the provocation at all. So we are hopeful. I am hopeful. Tom may not be, I don't know, although he's very hopeful with the, the technology things, which is an intriguing way to help in here and now. You know, that's essentially what he's gone to do, is try to figure out ways we can bend the needle now, and, and that's what he's trying to do now. My, my question has to do with, I guess, phase locking as a biomarker, kind of going back to the early parts of your talk. Um, and I guess I'm curious about the actual computations these neurons are encoding or the information they're encoding during the test. Like, can you, can you speak a little bit to, and this is just a, a more broad question about yeah. the field in general, why does that lead to, for example, in the TMAs, that this task is tougher to learn? And my question really is more about information content rather than information right. trafficking. Do we even need to know that if you have your gene to behavior flowchart worked out? 
So, uh, so I skipped over the work that we've done on information content, predominantly in the prefrontal, uh, really exclusively for my own work, in the prefrontal cortex and how that depends upon the direct projection. There's a short answer to, that is, which is that um, the prefrontal cortical neurons in both tasks represent the spatially, the, the task relevant spatial information. So they represent which arm the animal is in and the moment in the teammates and they represent the openness versus closeness of the arms in the elevated plus maze. So um, we don't know, if, by the way, if it's the same neurons, but, but we, we suspect based purely on the numbers that they are overlapping sets of neurons at the very least. So they are representing task-relevant spatial information. And when you inhibit that direct hippocampal to prefrontal projection, their representation of task-relevant spatial information goes away completely. That's the astonishing thing. We, I didn't talk about it, but we only decrease this monosynap monosynaptic input by about uh, 30 to 40 percent max. I shouldn't say that, minimum. We increase the, decrease the monosynaptic projection by 30 percent minimum, the overall hippocampal to prefrontal uh, input, which includes polysynaptic components, we decrease by 30 percent. So that's why it's our max. So anyway, we ab completely ablate task-relevant spatial information with the, with the manipulation in both tasks. Interestingly, and this gets to the gamma theta thing, um, it's gamma that seems to be carrying that in the working memory and theta, which seems to carry it in the, in the anxiety. But anyway, so what computation are the prefrontal cortical neurons performing? At the very least, they are performing a computation that leads their firing patterns to be spatially organized around task relevant variables. Um, we think they might be actually doing two different things in the different tasks. We think in the T maze task, they are encoding into working memory. They're writing into working memory the spatial location of the goal from the sample run and, um, and then retrieving it during the, uh, during the choice run. The reason why I say there's two different things is because we only wipe out one of them with the hippocampal inhibition, not the other. They can retrieve fine, but they can't encode. Now, in the anxiety-provoking environment, uh, the best data, we, the best evidence we have, it, it's not thorough, but is that it's, um, it's actually that they're actually engaged in inhibiting exploration of the open arm. So lots of reasons why I believe those two things. I'm happy to talk about some other time. The research that you presented on schizophrenia was really hopeful because you're able to look at a gene and understand how that could contribute to cognitive deficits. And I'm wondering about your um, antagonism approach. Is there a way that we can translate that into the patient population? Is there already a drug on the market that can target that receptor? And also, if we target that receptor in humans, are there a lot of side effects that we should be worried about? So, um, so the, the immediate answer to the question at hand is we're working on it. Um, GSK3 beta is not a bad target to think about from a human perspective. There are drugs on the market that it, do lots of other things but do inhibit it. One can imagine testing. But we need to know when in the life of the animal it's important to do it. We need a, a more proximate model, I think, uh, to the human uh, than the mouse to be able to be confident about it. GSK3 is expressed everywhere, and GSK3 alpha is in the heart, and antagonizing it is bad. So, um, so you want a beta-specific drug, and the drugs aren't that different. So there's lots of things we need to work on before we would think about moving to clinical trials. I was getting this up because I thought you were going to ask a different question, and I'm going to answer that different question um, <laughs> because that's because I get to do that. Um, uh, but I gotta find this thing here. Someone can ask another question while I'm looking this up, and then I'll interrupt you. Here you go. Okay, I just had a quick question going back, kind of a few questions ago when you're talking about bending the needle. Yeah. Go ahead. So there's already a disparity in people able to receive mental health treatment, and yeah. I worry a little bit about when we focus on all these methods. How are we going to reliably really put it into the actual population. And a lot of people, like a majority, who are suffering from mental health who may not have access to even adequate mental health or health care in general as of now. And you mentioned um, in, a, um, in one of your slides um, the approach in total of uh, circuits is, one, you know, identifying parts of the circuit and then 
you know, people will just want to go to the next part of the circuit, but you mentioned how important it was to look at ways to modulate it. How important do you think it is for scientists to be mindful of, at the same time, searching for feasible ways to modulate these circuits to really impact the environment now, considering the burden is so high right now? So I think it's a great question. Um, so I have to avoid being political because I'm not allowed to be. Uh, but um, access to mental health care is terrible right now. Um, and that's despite laws that are intended to enhance parity. And that's despite you know considerable effort. But we don't have enough resources expended on mental health care right now to reach everyone. And even if we did, there would be issues of access having to do with geography, having to do with bias, and actually having to do with bias on both sides of the equation. Um, minority groups are less likely to seek it and less likely to get it when seeking it. So we need to expand access. There's lots of ways to do that. That's a problem now, and it will be a problem if we don't address it through some uh, important things that we'd love to be able to see done in the US. And I'll leave it at that. But you're right. We're imagining these high tech, potentially very expensive solutions. But what we forget is that it's a very expensive problem we are trying to solve. So what we need to do is ensure cost effectiveness. One of the ways to ensure cost effectiveness is to reduce the cost of our treatments. And nothing I've said today is really going to do that. But the other way we can ensure cost effectiveness is to improve the performance of our treatments. Even if they are expensive, if they work very well, then we should apply them. And from a cost benefit basis, even the most expensive psychiatric treatments are incredibly beneficial. And there are many things which we don't do, which we should be doing, because they cost so little compared to other life-saving or burden-reducing interventions in medicine that are routinely reimbursed. So that's the political problem. The scientific problem is ensuring that as we develop these new things that we, that we demonstrate that they are cost-effective. So I think that's crucially important, and it is a facet of what NIMH does. I want to come back now to the question that wasn't answered that I wanted to answer. So I, I showed this nice, pretty diagram that goes from here to there. I pointed out there's 108 loci, now 180. So this is the diagram. And whoever said environment, you'll, you'll like this because it's on there. We have now lots of genes with a few environmental factors to scroll in. And uh, one of which is pollution, actually. that We know that impacts uh, schizophrenia and autism. Um, and this is what the diagram probably looks like. We hope that there is some critical convergence or some set of, of convergences. Uh, we know that there is divergence, that particular, so particular phenotypes at the level of the cell or the circuit can result in multiple phenotypes at the level of behavior. We hope there's a critical convergence. There's one or a set of um, common mechanisms at some level, maybe it's the level of the circuit, as illustrated here, that we can intervene with, with a limited set of interventions. But it's also possible that it will remain a mess and, um, and we have to acknowledge that and develop ways to study the complexity of this system. So that's the question I thought you were, the previous person was going to ask. And I think that's a perfect note to uh, end today's presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Kelvin Lim. I'm a uh, professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Psychiatry. And I want to welcome you to this uh, special event. Uh, it is a panel discussion uh, sponsored by the Center for Neurobehavioral Development, and its title is Infusing Computational, wait, Infusing Development into Computational Psychiatry. Um, and uh, I just want to say a few words of those to, about the, the Center for Neurobehavioral Development. It is a uh, multidisciplinary, and you hear that a lot, but uh, something that's always been struck me, it's also funded by multiple colleges throughout the university. And I think that's a credit to the founders and the current uh, leaders, including uh, uh, Michael Georgiev and Megan Gunner, who is here today. Um, and its goal is to understand brain and behavioral development throughout childhood from infancy through adolescence. And it is an active research center uh, with about 9,000 square feet. And I was told there are 15 windows, too. I mean, that's kind of an important thing in Minnesota. Uh, and there are over 30 active studies going on there, funded by various agencies, including uh, our favorite, the NIMH, and uh, the NIH and NSF. Uh, so when we were planning this um, 
uh, this panel discussion, we were trying to decide how, how to actually um, organize it. And with two screens here, I can't organize my own slides. Okay, so uh, many of you are familiar with this uh, uh, recent uh, seminal publication, Computational Psychiatry, New Perspectives on Mental Illness, edited by David Reddish, who's here with us today, and also, and Josh Gordon, who's also here with us today. Um, and uh, this is now required reading for all faculty in the Department of Psychiatry. In fact, if you, you, you know. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. But uh, and, and if those of you who, ha you know, those of us who haven't fully finished reading it, we sleep with it under our pillow, of course. Uh, but one of the things that we were aware of as we were reading it and discussing it among ourselves is that there's relatively dr little mention, if any, dr about neurodevelopment. And so we thought this might be an opportunity to kind of have that uh, discussion. And uh, what we decided the way to organize this was to have four presentations from our four panelists here, who are members of uh, CNBD. Uh, and the idea is I, and I'm going to need your help in doing this, because um, what we're going to do is have four presentations, 10 minutes, but they only have three minutes to present then they get to ask a question, and this is what I posed to the panelists, okay, was that pose a question that you would like, like if you were in a kind of a private setting with Josh Gordon, that you would like him to answer at that stage. And so they have done that. And so at the end of their three minutes, which guess who's timing that? Okay, but you'll help me, okay? If, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm missing, you'll kind of wave to me if that's it. Then we'll switch to their slide about that. And the idea is, is um, We'll see if uh, it's something that uh, Dr. Gordon wishes to jump in immediately, or he wants to hear from the audience. Or, but the idea is to stimulate discussion about this very important, uh, very important topic. Okay, so that's uh, so the format is four presentations. Uh, I'm hoping we're getting questions and comments and discussion with the audience throughout this. But um, I wanted to leave the last five minutes for Dr. Gordon so he can have the last word. That's it. So that's that. That's 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 our format, and so we're we're already five minutes in here at this point. Okay, so we're going to start start off with uh, Jed Ellison from the Institute for Child Development, and let me just introduce the rest of our speakers, our panelists. There's also Patrick Rothwell from the uh, Department of Neuroscience, Suma Jacob from the Department of Psychiatry, and Katie Cullen from the Department of Psychiatry. So Jed, we'll start with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, Great to have you here. I uh, really appreciated your presentation earlier. Um, what we heard uh, for an hour and a half earlier was really the, the, the frontiers of palliative therapeutics. And so what I'm, uh, I'm going to pose a question to you in a minute, but what we're trying to think about with my research group and some of my collaborators is uh, preventive interventions or preventive uh, approaches to uh, uh, child psychiatry. So... Um, one approach that we've taken, uh, and here with the slide, all I'm representing is some, uh, an approach, a developmental approach that we may be taking to the computational psychiatry movement. Um, and the way that I understand this movement, and from sleeping with the book underneath my, uh, in my bed, and just letting it, you know, learn by osmosis, really. But um, there are kind of two approaches. One is, is mathematical modeling of actual, the computational approaches involved with learning and, and, and specific uh, uh, circuit level behavior. Another approach is, is leveraging uh, novel computational analytics for uh, uh, new approaches to parsing heterogeneity in, 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 in samples. So here uh, we have a paper, this is brand new, uh, um, it's, it's under review right now, um, that we're calling this approach pheno screening. Um, and this is a de developmental approach to RDOC motivated sampling. But what we're trying to do is tap into a, a broader sample, a, a, a quasi population based sample. Um, with a lot of information provided by the parent. Um, normal uh, population-based screening would use a 20-item yes-no questionnaire that has reasonable uh, sensitivity, but probably not that good and never very good specificity, um, and, and in order to reduce burden. And so we, we said to ourselves, well, why don't we incentivize parents to give us more information about their child's development and then use these data-driven computational approaches to derive risk profiles uh, and then test the clinical utility of these risk profiles. 
So I don't have a pointer, but what you see is we've selected a couple of brand new measures, that one of which we developed here, um, that are tapping aspects of autistic traits uh, in very young children. And so we sampled uh, 1,570 uh, toddlers between 18 and 24 months with these new uh, parent report questionnaires, one workhorse parent report, parent report questionnaire, and then these two other novel uh, parent report questionnaires. We use all of that information in a data-driven way uh, to derive these profiles of risk. So we don't want to predict a binary outcome. Uh, you alluded to earlier, you know, these uh, DSM categories are not natural kinds that exist in nature. Let's try it. We're all trying to understand the heterogeneity of these disorders. Let's use an analytic strategy that doesn't try to predict the binary outcome. So here we're characterizing a profile, a continuum of risk profiles. And we have preliminary data that suggests that this, uh, this approach has some prognostic utility, such that we're identifying very small profiles out of our 1570 uh, that are showing a, a risk behavior. Now, I want to anchor, you know, set that approach up next to what's happening in the United Kingdom with the Biobank study. So they are starting with brain imaging. Well, there's in 100,000 of the ultimately 500,000 individuals that they're going to see. And I think that this is going to revolutionize the way that we think about neuro neurodegenerative disorders. Um, I think we have an opportunity to think in a novel way about neurodevelopmental disorders, borrowing some of this infrastructure that they're, that they're doing in the UK bio, Biobank study, but in a kind of population-based way with uh, very young children. And if we can identify precursors in toddlers and preschoolers, we might be able to develop new novel interventions preventative interventions uh, that would have long, long-term long effects. Um, so the question that I have for you, how do you, in, you know, and we, how do you envision balancing, so as, as a, not only as a scientist, circuit scientist, uh, circuit psychiatrist, uh, but also as the director of NIMH, how do you envision balancing priorities between, you know, quote unquote vaccines and versus iron lungs or this, these palliative type therapeutics? So that's a, uh, that's a good question. I think uh, the, um, it's hard for me to say that one thing should be prioritized over another. And I'd prefer to think about things in terms of what are the scientific opportunities that, that, are, uh, that are present. Um, prevention is a, is, has two big problems. One is that um, identifying those who uh, need the preventative in intervention. Because what you essentially need from that is uh, population-based screening. If you want to do primary intervention, or uh, high-risk groups with, that are relatively predictable, if you want to do sort of secondary intervention, uh, secondary prevention. Um, and those studies are, uh, especially if you're thinking about primary screening, incredibly challenging, expensive, and large. Um, especially for rarer conditions. Maybe autism isn't so rare anymore. We should be thinking about that. So that's one problem. And the second problem is, for some conditions like autism, prevention is uh, very, very controversial in the patient population. If you ask stakeholder groups, there are different stakeholder groups in autism who uh, feel uh, very, very strongly on both sides of whether we should be seeking preventive measures. Um, because there are, uh, particularly among high-functioning individuals with autism, they feel very, uh, very much that uh, the disease not only doesn't only define them in terms of pathology, but actually in terms of um, differences which they find um, a unique part of their identity and, and which they would prefer, have preferred to hold on to if given the option. So those are two challenges with prevention. Of course, the idea behind Prevention approaches, though, is that one can have tremendous public health impact because, again, you're, you're taking it from a primary perspective and you're reducing the impact of a disease before it happens. Perhaps it's even more important that we think about these things in psychiatry when we can imagine the end stage of disease, as we've talked about throughout the day today, being the end result of not just the etiology but also the plastic responses to that etiology and to the environment and to all those other things so that by the time you get to the treatment perspective, the palliative of time, there may be only limited things you could actually do. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it gives you some, some of my thoughts on the area. 
I think this is also an opportunity for questions if this is kind of motivating any ideas from the audience too. This, this should be an opportunity for audience member questions. But I would just say, you know, I think that we're uh, close. I work on a, a very big network of uh, researchers uh, studying infant siblings of children with autism. And I don't think that we're too far from a, uh, uh, a prevention trial. And, and as, as a scientist, I'm not overly concerned with the term or the idea of autism. I think we all know that it's not a natural kind. It doesn't exist in nature. And there are lots of different types of profiles that uh, receive this name of autism. And for the individuals who want to keep their name, I think that's fine. Um, but as, as a scientist and as someone who's worked with families who have children with autism and co-occurring intellectual disability, I think anything that we can do to, to, to help early on, the better, right? And so, and I think in the high risk state, it's not just autism now, I think that there's evidence coming out in uh, bipolar disorder in, in high risk individuals about predictive al algorithms, uh, predicting subsequent uh, kind of onset of, of, of symptomatology. Um, you know, leveraging what we learn from these high risk samples and then uh, our, our capability to port them to a population based is going to be certainly challenging. But I think we're there, we're there on some of these conditions with high risk state. Yeah, so we have, um, so we, we have some efforts that we're trying in autism to, to look at the efficacy of population based screening at 18 months. And, um, in, and we are, so we know it works, but what we don't know is if individuals screened at 18 months benefit from being screened at 18 months, which is different than asking, can you screen 18 months? And then we have other efforts trying to identify, uh, you know, 12, six month and 12 month predictors. So we get, get earlier and earlier. Um, so I summarize all of that though in autism as secondary prevention. Cause, cause by then things have already happened, right? Yeah. 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 Any question out here? Uh, Doug. When you, uh, what, what, when you're dealing with prevention, when you're dealing with prevention, isn't one of the other issues also the fact that you're talking prediction and therefore some subset of the, I mean, Unless you get 100%, right? But assuming that given all the data we've seen and all this kind of stuff, I think it's unlikely we'll be actually able to separate by 100%. That means some subset of your preventive treatments are being applied to people who don't actually have the disorder. Is that more of an ethical kind of concern in the preventive world than the palliative world? Does that change the factors at all? So one answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good start. And the, the, the reason why I say that is because you're thinking about it from the binary has the disease, don't disease, has the disease perspective. Now I know you are not naive enough to, to think that that actually is meaningful, but phrasing it that way suggests that those who don't go on to develop autism are perfectly fine. And uh, I'm much more familiar with the efforts around clinical high risk and schizophrenia. But it's the same issue. We can identify people at very high risk um, who go on to get psychosis with a 50% rate, or maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. And there are interventions that we are now testing in that group. Uh, of course, because they're not manifest disease, we should probably use lower impact, lower side effect interventions. Let's start there. But then you think, aren't you treating the other 50% unnecessarily? Well, there's very good evidence that the other 50% are not, are still impaired, mm -hmm. right? And so you may be beneficial with a preventative measure wider than just the diagnostic group. That's one answer. Okay, we, we, one last comment and then we're gonna move yeah, to the next and one. Another example of that is a lot of the interventions that um, are done with children so early are behavioral and educational. So I work with a community program that two-thirds of the kids don't have any just known risk, a third do, but they can all receive it. And it's that element of if a communication, social communication is a challenge, and you shift that so they have the ability to do social communication, those secondary things, those really um, self-injurious or other kind of behaviors that evolve by not communicating are prevented. And from those examples, I haven't seen any downside 
to young kids learning more about emotion regulation or socialization? So uh, to, 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 to push a panic button for a moment, to, to rile you all up so that maybe more people participate. Uh, so the, and then I'll let you run. Sure. So one of the things that people are in the autism world are really afraid of is um, pre-screening of, of um, fetuses and abortion of fetuses at a high likelihood of, of autism. That's one thing that people are very concerned about from lots of different elements of the world and not just from the perspective of you know, whether or not abortion is, is, um, is ethically or morally correct. So there you're talking about an, an autism risk gene that confers maybe perhaps even a very high level. We can do this already. We can do these prenatal genetic diagnoses already and people might make the decision to abort or not when the risk is not 100%. That more highlights really what you're talking about. And I think that's, you know, that's where you start getting into the, maybe the answer to your question might be yes. Anyway. Okay, so we'll move on now to, to Patrick Rothwell. So I cannot speak to that issue at all. And to be honest, I have to apologize to, to Josh and everyone else that I can't really speak much to computational psychiatry. It's not my world that I live in, but what I can speak to is circuits. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the circuit work we're doing and then kind of raise a, an interesting developmental question. So we'll get back to development, I promise. Um, what my lab uh, and, and many others are working on is taking some of these high-risk genetic variants that have been identified in human genetic studies of patients with autism spectrum disorders and introducing them into mice and then trying to understand how they change brain function. And we're interested in a level that wasn't one uh, Josh really focused on, although he did mention it, which is the level of, of synaptic communication. So we know that a large number of these autism-associated genetic variants encode proteins that localize to synapses and influence synaptic communication between neurons. We are studying that in one specific part of the brain, uh, which in analysis is called the striatum. It's the equivalent of the caudate and putamen in humans and primates. And uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, entry nucleus and largest nucleus within the basal ganglia. It, it certainly isn't the only part of the brain that is affected in patients with autism, but is certainly one part of the brain that uh, has repeatedly emerged as showing anatomical and functional changes in individuals who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. And so we are trying to study the impact on these mutations on synaptic communication in, in as specific a way as we can by differentiating the different kinds of cells that populate the striatum. So we can identify these different cell types uh, by the markers that they express. And so uh, one big division within the striatum is that there are a large population of neurons that can be split into two subpopulations based on their expression of different dopamine receptors. So they can express either the D1 subtype of dopamine receptor, uh, and we have in which those cells are labeled with a red fluorescent. So in the pretty picture in the upper right of the slide, those are the red cells. Uh, and they contrast with the green cells, which are cells that express the D2 subtype of dopamine receptor uh, and also express a green fluorescent protein. And if you look at that pretty picture, what you see is those two cell types are different. If you zoom in on the striatum, uh, the is on the left of the picture, uh, there's not much yellow, meaning the two reporters aren't intermingled. They're in different populations of cells that also form different projections out of the striatum, the downstream structures in the basal ganglia. You can see a, a small green projection and a much longer red projection there. Uh, so the reason this matters is that when we look at the impact of these genetic mutations, we see effects that are specific to the type of cell upon which a synapse is formed. So in the long diagram on the left, what I'm showing you is that I've spent a lot of time studied uh, mutations in neuroligand 3, which is a synaptic cell adhesion molecule. Uh, which has a variety of, of point mutations and, and exonic deletions that are highly penetrant, although low in frequency and are associated with autism spectrum disorders. What my own work has showed is that those neuroligand 3 mutations in orange impair a, a specific kind of synaptic communication, which is inhibitory synaptic signals onto the D1 medium spiny neurons. They impair those synapses without affecting any of the other synapses that are being shown in this schematic. And so that points to a very specific type of problem. And what's fascinating is that the striatum more generally seems to be a hot spot for the effects of, of more than one of these genetic mutations. So what I'm also highlighting is that mutations in shank 3 which are causative in Phelan-McDermid syndrome, 
uh, which is often associated with autism spectrum diagnosis, uh, also impair synapses within this brain region, but a different uh, set of synapses. In this case, the synapses then transmit excitatory signals onto the D2 medium spiny neurons. And I've also highlighted in pink there uh, uh, CHD8, which is another uh, um, High, relatively high frequency mutation associated with autism, relatively meaning, you know, half a percent to a percent, uh, that affect the same region of the brain, although we're not quite sure which cell type they affect. But so we're at least able to localize synaptic effects of these three different genetic variants to these cells in the striatum. And so in our lab, we're thinking very hard about what we might do, what interventions we might be able to perform to restore normal function or to at least compensate for the change in function caused by these genetic perturbations. Now, the thing I wanted to highlight, which leads to my developmental question, yes? Yeah, that's, I'll get to the question right now. Sorry about that. Um, in the lower right here is some very interesting developmental data from the Shank 3 mutants that was published in Bernardo Sabatini's lab last year. And what it shows is that at P60 is where the decrease in excitatory synaptic transmission has previously been reported. And they were able to confirm that. But when they looked at earlier developmental time points, they actually saw the opposite. At P14, during the period in which these synapses are developing, there was actually an enhancement of these excitatory signals. And what it makes me wonder is I'm someone who always looks at mature animals. I look out at P60. I think about what's wrong and what we could do to fix it. But this would suggest that we actually need to pay much more attention to what's happening early on, both in terms of the basic biology and as we think about interventions, whether we need to tailor those interventions to a specific stage of development. And I was just curious about your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I agree in that there's more than just that piece of evidence to suggest it. I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, actually a couple of other autism predisposing genes as well is that there's this hint that's mimicked in, in studies of human structural development that autism might be an acceleration of early development that then freezes in place. And that, so you, you prevent the normal critical period processes that happen at the right time. And so it, that data suggests that there's also data from, uh, from the fragile X mouse, uh, that suggests it from rets. So anyway, that's one thing. And then the other, uh, and then in humans, uh, there's accelerated brain growth early in autism, uh, and, uh, it's a large head circumference, actually, in autism as well. So there's some ideas about the timing of development really matters. To get to this question about interventions at a particular time point, you know, we've been talking about that off and on most of the last, you know, 24 hours. Uh, just one example is um, with regard to the uh, the sequence events in, uh, again, uh, schizophrenia, a disease I know a little bit better than autism, um, that there's growing appreciation that uh, that that the the excitatory and inventory balance thing shifts from primary glutamatergic problem to a primary uh, primary uh, uh, GABAergic problem as you go from you know first episode psychosis into chronic schizophrenia. And so you can imagine that if you intervene at one point, you need to address one issue, where if you intervene at another, you need to address another. And we don't, in the animal literature, pay enough attention to that. Um, in literature, we don't do enough longitudinal studies. So even the hypothesis is really driven by cross-sectional studies at different different time points of the illness, as opposed to following individuals through the time course. And uh, we need more longitudinal studies during development and during the course of illness. Another specific question related to your talk earlier is you showed this really elegant data with GSK3 beta inhibitors, where you were matching the period of intervention during development to the period where you had studied the neurons and culture, which I thought was really beautiful. But I was curious whether you had attempted to do that intervention in the mature nervous system, whether it had the same effect, whether it would no longer so, be effective. So we, we have those experiments that are sort of undergoing. Uh, under, uh, we we want to know when in that four-week window is it really necessary? Would, it, would adult rescue? Um, we also need to know what the uh, state of the hippocampal prefrontal system is earlier in life during that period of time. Uh, we actually have a collaboration. Uh, really, Joseph has one with uh, someone in Germany who investigates that period with hippocampal peripheral connectivity. So we, we can answer those questions through longitudinal studies in animals that we just haven't really, really had the opportunity yet to do. Questions, comments? Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that this idea of a speeding up of normal maturation is also showing up in research on early adversity. And there as an adaptation. So threat right. systems mature a little more quickly, right. may reach their asymptote 
earlier, and so this can also be a part of adaptation, but it does predict disorder later. Yeah, yeah. So Thanks, good point. I spent a lot of my time thinking about the neurobiology of drug addiction, which I think of, uh, like many people do, as an experience-dependent form of maladaptive plasticity, and so this might be a little bit different than than development. But I wonder whether, we, we think sometimes in the addiction world about whether there are windows of plasticity that open um, or could be opened at later times, even after the nervous system's been affected, that might um, allow for certain therapeutic interventions. Um, and I don't know if that's, I, mean, I just started thinking about it when you showed those data there that, uh, you know, if there's a possibility and it also is uh, with, with your schizophrenia model and the axonal remodeling, you know, what, it, it's just to me, a fascinating thing to think about. It, it's an idea that comes a lot from the, the learning literature, you know, where this idea of the kind of reopening of the consolidation, you know, this reconsolidation idea, things like that. I wondered if anyone had any thoughts about that in developmental disorder terms. Hyperlearning or hyperplasticity. Um, as well as all the alterations we've been talking about, neuroinflammatory alterations, alterations in GABAergic functioning, and so forth. And I think, you know, in terms of targeting circuits, you know, we talked a little bit this morning about intersectional approaches, two ways of coming at the problem that might synergize, and maybe you could take an effect and synergize it with some kind of manipulation that would increase the potential for plasticity or, 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 or just boost the capacity in a way that isn't normally present, and maybe that kind of synergy would be an effective approach to address that issue. Okay, why don't we move on to our uh, next panelist, uh, Suma Jacob. So as um, Patrick kind of highlighted what you had said earlier about the neurobiological approach, which is way, how I trained in, in neuroscience, um, and Jed, suggested we have access to large big data. Um, in Minnesota, we've been part of the, some of these national and regional big data pieces. And so we are beginning to collect both structured and unstructured and it allows you know, the three Vs, volume, variety, velocity, um, with technology, with our ultimate goal to have a very precise um, and individualized treatment. And like you said at the end of the, at your talk, that's a pretty big, ambitious goal. In really, really sleeping with the book that you guys wrote, um, I looked through the chapters, poured through the, the struggle we have with temporal data. And there are two challenges I really find in child psychiatry. One is um, our lack of data, as Jed alluded to the data set that we, you know, we're working on with typical development. We really need those individual and um, subgroup differences in typical development to compare and anchor our psychopathology on, and the bigger need for longitudinal time that's beyond the three to five year cycle in collecting this data. And the pieces, very much like that first figure that you showed, these disorders cluster together, like TIC, OCD, ADHD, um, autism, they're together frequently. So again, we need to get really good at coming up with these trajectories, and the trajectories are different, because um, mathematically I've talked to, been involved in projects with this big data, where it's a normalization of some of the trajectories, and once, in, in patients sometimes, once their special skills, once you give them an intervention, their special skills go away as you're modulating these other systems but we need this combination of going from big data to modeling, and so that leads to my question, which is, um, with in your role um, in coming up in this, we're in this intersection now. What resources do you think are going to be available to think of? Not there's the unsupervised data, but high quality supervised data to um, that we need to do these multi dimensions like communication, motor, social um, models that integrate both typical and atypical development. But then our goal is to do, as Jed said, temporal predictions, but also these windows, even if it's secondary, of preventing what we can do for a six-year-old, what we can do 
with the middle school or what we can do with an adolescent or an adult if that's when they come to us. Uh, it's, it's real challenge. And to be honest, one of the biggest challenges is going to be money. So uh, you're probably aware of the attempt to create a national children's study. Uh, I hear some, you know, tisks in the back. Um, it, it failed. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm not exactly sure that was before my time, but I just hear enough rumors enough to know that I can't ask. Um, and so it's been replaced by this echo, which is trying to look at existing cohorts and put them together in some way that you get to a big data approach. The, the ask is important, but it's also tremendous. We, to be honest, I don't think we have the resources to do that right now. I, I, and I, I don't know, maybe you could come up and tell me what the dollar figure is we would need, but my guess is it'd be tremendous. ABCD is the first attempt to do that. There is also a baby ACD, ABCD, which is younger, um, which, uh, which may do that. But I don't think those are the numbers that we're going to need. I think we need, you know, pretty big numbers and, um. Beyond, beyond 10,000. Yeah. I mean, I think we'll get something from ABCD. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be more relevant, perhaps, for these adolescent onset and adult onset illnesses uh, than it is for most of the child onset illnesses. And there are pockets of um, important endeavors in the child onset illnesses. So for example, we have um, some efforts that are longitudinal around anxiety that I think, uh, but, but the thing that, things that you're talking about, a sort of global, um, high dimensional, longitudinal data set with deep phenotyping in kids that's truly cross sick. It's a big, big expensive ask. And to be honest, I don't think we have enough money to do it. We'll let, we'll let Minnesota be the proving ground for that. <laughs> hey, you know, if someone comes with creative ideas to do it, I didn't think we had the money or energy to do the the, the kind of phenotyping that we need in a cross-sectional adult way, but it turns out that NIH is investing a few hundred million dollars in starting up the, the all of us cohort in adults. Right? Eventually, they will hopefully get around to kids, but will they be enrolling prenatal or tots? Unlikely. Um, so I, I, you know, I think I, I'm not at all dismissing the importance. Um, Resources. But the resources. It's a resource issue. So um, my question is going to be a suggestion, actually. So how do we do this when resources are scarce? As somebody who's really much wanting to do longitudinal work um, in bipolar disorders, and um, so it's a different psychopathology, but we have a lot of people here who do longitudinal research, and a lot of it is funded by an MH. So maybe one of the ways, and I say this as somebody who values my scientific freedom, um, is to require certain measures to be included in longitudinal studies across pathology to say, okay, if you want NMH to fund, a, fund you, you have to have this kind of structural scan or this kind of resting state included. You have to have this kind of cognitive measures, this kind of behavioral measures included. And then you're not funding one big study, you're funding a whole bunch of different studies who are looking at a whole bunch of different risk populations and having uh, normative control groups, and you could um, build over time that kind of a database. Uh, so I agree, and we are, I would say there is some slow movement in that direction. Certainly we have the tools on a voluntary basis available for people to include in their studies common data elements, common behavioral assessments. They're not ideal, they're not computationally derived, et cetera, and I don't know how much uptake there is some uptake. Essentially, the ECHO program is trying to do that, take existing cohorts and get them to as much as possible, use some common data elements, and report out and data share. So to a certain extent, that is being done. To a certain extent, it's not being done. Did I see another hand out here? Was there another question back here? There are, the, other, the other thing I would say is that another way to approach this is from a registry standpoint or from a learning healthcare system standpoint, I think that, that there is some hope we might be moving in that direction. There are already healthcare systems that cover large numbers of people that are doing research on their EMRs and that are, to a limited extent, doing some additional assessments and interventions. So that's another approach one could take to these issues. In the back there. So as mentioned previously, um, it's definitely known now we need more longitudinal studies. We need more data not just looking at certain time points. And as you guys mentioned, it is 
a huge financial cost that may not be feasible at this time. Um, I just think back of, you know, sex differences. The research started showing, okay, there is something, and then there's been a push towards, you know, you have to include both of them for a lot of sources of funding. Are there any kind of incentives or <clears throat> motivations for maybe even just on the neurobiological basis? Because of what we know about neurodevelopment, we need the longitudinal studies. Are we focusing on pushing researchers to look at all those different time points? Um, there are some requirements and or incentives to include children in studies of adults. <clears throat> Uh, so there are, there are, you have to justify why you're restricting to a particular age range now. If you're doing clinical studies that could be carried out in children. Um, and so that will increase some of, you know, so one, one big thing that I'm told by child psychiatrists is that a lot of the drugs we use in kids have never actually been tested in kids. And so that's an effort to try to overcome that particular issue. I'm not aware of any particular incentives to, to, um, encourage or regiment, um, longitudinal studies. Great. So let's see if I can get this right here. Josh, this is the second time you've gotten to see this. So I'm giving you another moment to contemplate this slide. And I'll just, for the audience, um, share. This is a um, kind of a summary of a current project that some of us here in the department and other departments are, are working on. It's about adolescent self-injury. Um, it is a longitudinal study, not a super long um, uh, capture, but uh, th um, we're ca doing, um, looking at three different RDOC constructs at different levels of analysis um, over a course of three years and um, trying to understand the neurobiology um, implicated in this behavior and trying to capture um, what are the abnormal developmental processes happening at least during this window of adolescent development. And one of the, one of the things we're interested in in particular is um, capturing neurobiological, neurobiological trajectories within each construct, but then also capturing, like, or trying to at least understand how do these um, systems interact with each other, and they don't, you know, they don't follow their, they're not, they're not independent of each other, and trying to understand that. Um, so, um, and I, I I've. Um, looking at how these things predict outcomes, and we're going to be, and I, as I mentioned this morning, um, starting to apply some computational um, modeling to at least look at focusing on one of the tasks, and then we'll be working towards ap applying some of those ideas towards the whole data set. So I, um, I feel, I, I'm sorry to hear you're not getting a cut from that book, because we all have actually bought it. Um, <laughs> and I was... I feel like, I, I, as I was scouring it earlier this week, I, for neurodevelopmental, I, I think we were a little severe on them. I do think there was several instances where neurodevelopment is mentioned and talked about. It's just that it's like several of the authors talked about the importance of considering neurodevelopment and, and the fact that psychiatric disorders change over time and there's one pathology at one point and another pathology and that the, that there's... Uh, neuro, there's neuroadaptation where the, the disease itself drives a, new, a whole new pathology. So um, anyway, the authors of, of your book talk about how models need to incorporate this, but it was just never like, it was never explicated. So I was wondering if you could just, um, in a couple minutes, tell us how computational psychiatry can apply to some of our questions about the developmental origins of psychiatric illness and how treatments might restore healthy trajectories. How do you do it? Right. And if, or, or <laughs> yeah. are we there yet? Can we, like, is it possible at this point? Yeah. So I think there are some ways that we discuss in the book, at least peripherally, that one can imagine uh, doing it. And I'm going to butcher this. So anyone else who wants to jump in is welcome to. Dave. But through your co-editor, maybe? You know, like, uh, <laughs> so for example, you know, uh, I've written and talked about, although we haven't talked about it much today, an, uh, an approach to, to, uh, to testing out the ideas of RDOC computationally by asking whether adding in um, behavioral assessments to clinical diagnoses will improve prognostic indicators, will improve treatment selection, etc. Um, and 
Uh, and, and although the book discusses it as if it's a cross-section, you take a bunch of behavioral tests, you give it to an individual, or a whole bunch of individuals, and you ask whether the behavioral tests plus the uh, clinical diagnoses do better than just the clinical diagnoses at predicting response to a given treatment or at predicting prognosis into the future. You can also ask then, if you have the longitudinal developmental data that we just discussed are very expensive to get, um, you can ask whether the longitudinal time course of any given variable behavioral assessment or a neurobiologic assessment um, or some other assessment predicts outcome, uh, predicts time course, predicts treatment response by just feeding that variable, which is now not a single observation number variable, like a parameter, but it's a course of that parameter over time into the same sort of predictive algorithms. How did I do? Okay, so that's one aspect. That's sort of more from the big data approach aspect, which is if we were able to obtain these kinds of things, including the, the kinds of stuff that you are, uh, are, are hunting at, um, and that, uh, uh, if, you know, if you can include these longitudinal data sets and just feed in those variables, you might be able to differ differentiate heterogeneity. And I, I think we were discussing an example where in ADHD you can predict which which individuals are going to go on to maintain ADHD symptoms in adulthood versus which ones are going to die out uh, in adolescence based upon the trajectory of their symptomatology earlier in life. So when you can measure it, it gives you some hope you can actually do some predictive stuff. Uh, the other thing I think is we can use uh, modeling and theoretical approaches to ask the same kinds of questions we might ask about what computation a neural circuit is performing um, to ask uh, what kind of flexibility is there in a given circuit over time. How, it, how a circuit changes over time and how that might go wrong, right? Uh, so uh, just some simple, straightforward examples from my world of vision. We know that, you know, there's a critical period for visual cortical plasticity, that it's sort of, you know, a U-shaped curve, if you will, and that you can shift it back and forth over time. And through a combination of experimental and computational models, they've developed the notion that it's a particular kind of inhibition that, the, that, the, that closes off the critical period. And if you delay that inhibition, you close it off later. If you accelerate it, you close it off earlier. And so one can imagine those kinds of modeling-based approaches, maybe at a neurobiologic level, maybe at a more phenomenologic level, that allow you to answer critical questions about developmental processes that might be more relevant to psychiatric disease. So those are two examples of how one can use computation from a developmental perspective. David, did you want to? I want to make a I don't really have much to add. I'll say one thing. I, mean, I, agree with I think Josh did a great job of really you know, laying out kind of both. And I think the example from Vision is a really good one where, in fact, <coughs> computational technologies really did explain a lot of what the critical period was doing. Um, one thing I'll just point out is that there is a mathematics for trajectories, and they do exist. It's just pretty messy and complicated, and given the difficulty of actually applying the mathematics at the static level, you know, taking that next step is, it's hard to do, but it's very doable. And one can apply technology, you know, mathematical measures to, to trajectories as well. And, you know, and there is enthusiasm amongst computationists to study dynamics, both at the level that I was talking about earlier today, you know, in the dynamics of neurons, but also dynamics of trajectories over time in state space. So I think those are, there is enthusiasm amongst certain individuals there. But it does need lots of data. And as we said, I mean, even we've talked a lot, you know, just, you know, in, in between, you know, the projects you and I are working on, for example, test retest. So few examples actually just test people twice. It's hard to get a trajectory if you only have one time point. You know. So on the money front, while the microphone is moving, you know, ABCD is eighteen million dollars a year. It's ten thousand kids uh, nine years old. Up. So uh, that's that's the kind of money we're talking about. And as many of you may know, who get funded by NIDA, it when that started, <laughs> NIDA funding rates plummeted. Um, two, two comments on, on themes which just emerged um, in the last couple of comments. You know, one is this issue of, of measuring more than once, right? How useful that be? We have to have, we have to make sure the measures we're choosing are reliable. So that that's a whole issue, particularly I think around some of these um, kind of more um, cognitively based measures. We there's a lot that we still need to learn there. The second was in, has been embedded, I think, in something you just said.
show, it's been embedded in a few of the comments just, just now, which is this notion that it's going to be something about the dynamic properties of the, of the nervous system, which, are, which is likely going to represent um, a really critical feature of, of where this nervous system is going to be headed when it's exposed to, whether it's, it's um, um, pro, you know, problems uh, or insults from the exposome, or whether it's um, you know, genetic liabilities or genetic liabilities which might be contributing to the vulnerability in, in the, in the uh, nervous system. And that is um, the, the dynamic properties of the nervous system over short time scales. And most of the measures that we think about when we think about these kinds of sort of large data sets we're, we're accumulating are, are measures which are sort of, in a sense, they've got a, they're, they're very much got a static component to them. We are seeing how someone is doing on the working memory test, or we're trying to see what kind of measure we get out of some kind of cognitive control task. But um, as came up in the discussion this morning, what might actually be important is, is the actual um, dynamic pattern of responses that the, that the brain is engaging in as it is exposed trial by trial to the specific demands of this task at hand. And that might be what's actually revealing the critical features of this nervous system that have a determining force on, or determining or constraining um, force on where this nervous system is going to be headed when it is submitted to um, you know, various, as I said, environmental insults or, or uh, genetic alterations in its developmental pathways. I wasn't quite as articulated about that as I wanted to be, but it's, again, getting at the notion that we have to start thinking about ways in which we're probing some of these dynamic features um, of, of, of the brain's ability to respond over short time scales. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it reminded me about that discussion about the Iowa gambling test this morning. And I, and I want to point out that, yes, these big data things are, are very expensive <clears throat> if we want to get them, but there's an example of, of how much potential there is there. So we have all this Iowa gambling test data, and Dave says, oh, you're not assessing it from this dynamic perspective. Well, now you can go in and, and do it if it's there. So yes, it, it will be incredibly expensive to get this longitudinal study of kids. And, but it's something we should aspire to because we can imagine publishing that data and having people come at it from different perspectives and really being able to test <coughs> all these ideas and ask whether, yes, it does actually matter if you look at test free test effects. And that's where you get the thing that really going to tell you who's going to um, do well and who's not. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the shape of cognitive uh, performance across a range of different tests, or, uh, you know, or maybe it's very specific deficits for very specific people. So I think, you know, getting these data sets is important. I, I don't think right now we can start with the kids. Uh, maybe it's because we don't know how to do it quite right yet. yet. You know, Dave is pointing out that we don't really have the methods yet, or, um, and, and it's enough to start with doing something static in adults, um, or because it's, you know, unimaginably expensive for right now. But um, but I think we should eventually aspire to it. Other questions, comments? And when I say unimaginably expensive, I want to remind people that um, the Alzheimer's budget has tripled in the last two years, three years. So, uh, you know, if that happened to happen with uh, mental health, then we could probably afford that study. Or child health and human development, if, you know, they would also be interested in that kind of study. So I love thinking about the brain. I think it's a marvelous thing for you all to think about. But I also like thinking about how the brain is functioning in context, which for development, the challenge is that the developmental demands keep changing. So I'm interested in kids who come out of orphanages, deprivation. They don't necessarily, they're not depressed. They are not even conduct disordered as kids. They have problems that are very cognitive, the theory of mind, this, that, and the other. They had adolescence. Um, we're getting conduct disorder and depression. But what's happening is, I think, and when many of us think, is they're now trying to negotiate the complexity of the social world of adolescence with the cognitive issues that they have, which now no, it's just a real problem, right? They can't do it, so they're not having friends. And what's changed is the challenge of the social world and the relationships are falling apart. So how do we think about the brain and its task developing and some of the, gee, it suddenly emerged at this age. It's not a sleeper effect. It wasn't in that brain. It was in that brain's ability to cope with the changing demands of life as you develop. Where does your computational modeling come in on that? <laughs> Compute that. <Yeah>. You know? <laughs>
What's that? Oh, you want me to respond to you? Yeah. <laughs> he wants uh, to hear you. I mean, I think there is interest in trying to figure that out from a computational perspective to model what are the range of states that one uh, that an organism goes through, whether it be over behavioral time frames or developmental time frames, and then one can ask what how those how there might be a limited a more limited set of states or a different uh, abnormal set of states that might happen given uh, departure from the normal range of states that one progresses through developmental. It's also important not to also look at the computation. I mean, fundamentally, what you're asking is what are the limits of the end computation that help us understand it? I think the fundamental question is we have. I'm sorry. I think the fundamental question is we have to be looking at the brain in the context. And one of the things we often don't think about, but our tasks actually do, is they're challenging the brain. Right? So you're saying, how does this brain handle that challenge? And part of it may be that we want to be thinking about the challenges that the brain is doing in specific ways. Right? I mean, we often talk about, you know, when you're designing a task that you're going to do for somebody who is both, you know, in, in, intact and impaired, if I can use those words. Um, part of the problem is the people who are impaired can't handle some of the basic difficulties in the task. And you see general problems that actually are not indicative of the thing your task is trying to access. It's a general problem that is there overall. I think just thinking about it in terms of the interaction is, is kind of a key. Blind people cannot do a visual spatial looking memory task. <laughs> right. right. But uh, a group of four-year-olds is pretty bad at theory of mind, so the kid who can't do it very well does not stick out. A well, group of eight-year-olds. That's another possibility. That's that challenge, that the developmental challenge. I'd like to transition at this point, and um, I'd like to thank our uh, our panelists who took the time to prepare and plan for the session and also participate, if we could thank them. <laughs> uh, and then also to thank our uh, special visiting guest, uh, Josh Gordon, who will be, you have the last word. I get the last word. word. Uh, I mean, so I think, you know, what we've talked about today um, is uh, trying to place uh, neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental disorders in a computational context. And I think um, the bottom line is there is interest, there are tools, um, and uh, but there needs to be data. And, um, and we have data in some isolated pockets, but we don't have data that's really cross- uh, disorder that would enable us to better characterize the heterogeneity. And here now I'm talking not just static heterogeneity, but developmental time course heterogeneity as well. And um, the truth is we don't have that in adults either. Mm. We don't have that at the static level either. But it is easier to, from a, from a cost perspective and from a method perspective to contemplate how to do that in adults. And so we need to come up with more creative if we're going to try to address it on a large scale level in kids. So I love the suggestion of trying to make sure that people use common data elements. Um, the thought about, you know, registries or existing data sets, existing cohorts. Um, and, uh, but my guess is we're going to need a bigger concerted effort at some point down the line once we have an easy way to, or not an easy way, have a, 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 a pathway towards that. And I'm all ears if you can come up with one that's affordable or if you can convince other people to, to uh, give us the money to do it. Can't lobby for it myself. Not allowed. Great. Josh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you all for